local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Tuesday, June 1st. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 14 degrees, 15 in Smith Falls. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Well, happening now uh, in the city's West End, fire crews on scene of a blaze this morning on West Hunt Road. That is just north of Richardson Side Road near Carp Road. The fire in a large commercial building owned by Tomlinson, that company tweeting out that all staff are safe, but are asking you to avoid that area. Now, firefighters did arrive to find the recycling facility fully engulfed. Crews have set up aerial ladders trying to extinguish from above and are using a foam to try and smother the flames. Heavy smoke can be seen in the area from a distance. Now, Hunt Club, uh, West Hunt, sorry, is closed at Carp. Westbound 417 ramp to Carp Road is also closed. You can expect delays in that area. City News Time 901. Now, can you mix and match COVID vaccines? We're expecting an update today, and here's City News reporter Laura Carney. Federal officials will provide an update on COVID-19 at noon today, which will include updated guidance from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization on the interchangeability of COVID-19 vaccines. Sources telling the CBC that NACI will advise Canadians who received a first shot of AstraZeneca that it's safe to have a second dose of either mRNA vaccine, so that's Moderna or Pfizer. The decision is based on emerging research from Spain and the UK. In Manitoba, they're already doing this. Dr. Joss Reiner, head of that province's COVID-19 vaccine task force, announcing the mix and match approach yesterday. We had a chance with our clinical team to review all of the data. We received notification that the UK study would not be available in time to inform our decision, and we saw that Manitobans were feeling really anxious about uh, this information. Now, NACI will also reportedly recommend Canadians who have had a first dose of Moderna or Pfizer can now take either of the two as a second dose. I'm Laura Carney. City News Time 902 and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. For Ottawa, the Valley and Smith Falls today, we'll get into some clearing. Generally sun and cloud today, the high 26 degrees tonight, mainly clear in 12. And tomorrow, sunshine, rain moves in overnight Wednesday for Thursday morning and the high tomorrow, 27. For today, the high 26. And right now in Ottawa, 15 degrees in Smith Falls, it is 16. Now, what can we expect as far as the weather is concerned this summer, forecasters predicting a perfect barbecue season for the most part. Weather Network's chief meteorologist says Ontario and Quebec can expect some average temperatures, but there will be some hot days in between. Chris Scott also says Atlantic Canada can expect to see the summer heat this year. Agricultural regions of the prairies could see drought and B.C.'s interior could be in for an active wildfire season. Lots of economic news today, starting with StatsCan. The economy grew at an annualized rate of 5.6% in the first quarter this year. That comes after the OECD predicted yesterday growth in Canada would continue at a rate of 6.1% for the entire year. Canopy Growth Corporation reporting a loss in its latest quarter as revenue did grow to nearly 40% compared with one year ago. The cannabis company says its net loss attributable to the corporation totaled almost $700 million for the quarter ending March 31st, result compared to a loss of $1.3 billion in the same quarter last year. And there has been a large merger in natural resources as Pemina Pipeline Corporation has signed a deal to buy Inter Pipeline. That is worth $8.3 billion in stock. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Good, bad, or complicated. There's no news in Ottawa and the Valley he won't talk about. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Well, good Tuesday morning to you. It is June 1st. Am I the only one in denial that it's June 1st? I cannot believe how fast time goes. We have an incredible show for you today, jam-packed with all the information you need. We will also be keeping an eye on Queen's Park to see if the Premier 
talks about when and if schools will be opening. So we'll be definitely be keeping our eye on any breaking news. Today we are going to be talking about many, many different topics. But at the core of today's show, we're going to talk a lot about the genocide in this country. We're going to talk a lot about the 215 children who lost their lives in Kamloops, BC. We know that this is on the minds of all Canadians. So we want to talk about this in a number of different ways. So you'll definitely want to stay with us for that today. In the 10 o'clock hour, we're going to speak with Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole. We're going to ask him a number of different questions, including what's on the docket today in terms of opposition day. So we're going to chat with him. We're also going to ask him his thoughts on this horrific discovery in Kamloops, BC. So we're going to be talking to him. We're also going to be, of course, as we always do on Tuesdays, Rob enjoys his time with Ian Lee, professor, of course, at Carleton University. We're going to be talking about the Newfoundland budget reaction and it has a lot of people screeching. So we're going to be talking about that, of course. Uh, up first, we're going to head to the Valley and speak with Pembroke Mayor Michael LeMay. Hello, Mayor. Hi, how are you? Good, good morning. You have been a very busy person. I'm <clears throat> sure this weekend you would have preferred to be maybe just hanging out with your family, but you had to uh, deal with some issues in Pembroke. There was an anti-lockdown demonstration Talk to us about that, Mayor. Um, yes, there was the anti-lockdown uh, demonstration, but as I think everyone is well aware with the order to stay at home, of course, rallies or gatherings are illegal. Uh, in the case of this particular rally, it, uh, two or three months ago, I, there, there was some information on social media about the possibility of a gathering in Pembroke, and it did not occur. The organizers of this particular rally that did take place on Saturday had no contact with the city, so we had no idea. And if they had contact with the city, of course, we'd say no, because, of, you know, we uh, we tend to follow the law in Ontario, or at least we should. Mm -hmm. And this was a uh, provincial law that was uh, being broken. So uh, they, it, it was a small group that got together. I think there were roughly 150. And uh, I would say the majority of the people were probably outside of our community of Pembroke. But it was held. Um, and uh, like it's been going on, like, but has, I guess, these type of, uh, of uh, frustration with the provincial government and these uh, demonstrations, I guess, have been all over the place and in many different communities. So our, mm -hmm. our community happened to have one as well. It really is unfortunate uh, to see that a number of people were sort of coming from outside of the community. We know that a number of people that were there um, didn't represent sort of the, the core people in Pembroke. Was that of concern to you as well? It was a concern, but knowing, knowing, knowing our community, like overall we have a very caring community. And for the last 14 months, you know, we've gone through like every community uh, with the pandemic and all the changes. It's like a, a roller coaster. And of course, people in our community are tired and they're frustrated, but they also know the danger of the pandemic and really do care about one another. So we, we've not had any major issues with the city. I would say the majority of, of the people in Pembroke are tired like everybody else, but realize we've got to get through this. And what I'm hoping is that... Um, we will hear some sort of news from the provincial government shortly mm -hmm. uh, on you know, what's going to happen. And I think what, what creates a lot of the difficulty is just not knowing, um, you know, w w what is the next move? When are we going to be able to open? When is the, uh, you know, the order to stay at home going to be lifted? Like, those are questions. I hope that people either answers today or tomorrow. But we wait. We do wait, and I think it's, it is frustrating, I think, for, for all of us, right? I mean, I think all of us are sort of uh, waiting to find out when our children are going to go back to school, when those businesses open. There's lots of, of discussion right now on all those topics. Uh, what are you hoping? If, if people are frustrated, what should they do, Mayor? What, what would you suggest they do? Well, it's a, it's a case of... Uh, uh, um, 
Well, in our case, in the city, we encourage everybody, and I've been doing this for the last 14 months, that, that there are things that you can do to help, for instance, the business community, and that's shop local. Use the curbside. Um, most, uh, many of the small businesses, and that's what we have in Pembroke, a lot of small businesses need that help. And uh, uh, so far, our businesses are very fragile, but they are surviving under very difficult circumstances. And as far as the municipality, we put programs out there like the CIT, uh, COVID related, where we are able to provide grants to businesses just to help them move forward. We make sure our economic development people make sure that every small business and the people especially in the PBIA about, okay, what's available there? What grants are available? But everybody, it's the constant encouragement of please get out there and help the small businesses. And for your mental health, we're fortunate because we are called the heart of the Ottawa Valley, but we have our parks, our waterfront. And I've noticed more and more because the weather's been beautiful, more and more people are out, you know, walking uh, the streets, keeping their distance. And so from that, I worry about that aspect as well. And as you mentioned, please make a decision in regards to the schools to help the parents. You know, so just to know, are the open or closed period, at least people can move on. Absolutely. And, you know, let's just hope that that July comes and it might be a new normal, but Mm -hmm. hopefully during the summer we'll be able to get back to normal. And we know a lot of people obviously visit the Ottawa Valley uh, in the summertime. It it often is a stop on the way to to maybe camping or those those uh, outdoor recreation uh, things you mentioned. Um, how much of a hit was it in 2020 for those tourism dollars to not be there? And and really, what's the plan as soon as we hear the plan from the province for Pembroke uh, in terms of of your own tourism? Well, tourism, you were right. It was hit extremely hard, especially when you look at uh, Pembroke itself. We have a majority, I guess, of the hotels in the area here at Pembroke. So they were they were really, really hurt. And then, of course, whitewater rafting and Calabogie, the, the different areas that, that people use, uh, were really hard hit. So with the opening, our tourism people, our economic development people are working together and we're planning different activities that will be uh you know hopefully so we're, we're getting them organized now and uh it, it depends of course we hope to have entertainment as an example mm-hmm. every night down at the waterfront so we're planning it now with the hope you know that we're going to be able to do it so we're trying to stay uh you know ahead of, of the game and also we're fortunate we have um the murals, you know, uh, over 35 murals downtown, you know, you know, where people that decide they want to get out and uh, when the rule, now, not now, so we don't want to see anybody right now. Right, right. But, you know, during the summer to come up to Pembroke and uh, they're able to, for instance, stay in a hotel in Pembroke or our campsite at Riverside Park, look at the murals, take part in whitewater rafting. So we're fortunate in the upper Ottawa Valley. There, there are a lot of things to do. So everybody right now is okay. Let, let's let's plan as if we are going to be able to open up. So we'll be ready when the government says, "Okay, here's you know stage three as an example." Um, but anyway, we are planning diligently to you know to move forward when, when, once we get the okay. Because as far as I'm concerned, the priority is what the Renfrew County District Health Unit puts out as well as the province. We have to follow those instructions as we move forward. For sure. And of course, you know, there's lots of uh, there's lots of things to do in Pembroke. And I think I remember as a little girl growing up in Deep River, you know, it was exciting to go to Pembroke. <laughs> so I'm hoping, uh, you know, lots of people will be able to enjoy uh, your city. When you think about the, uh, the, the council docket, what you have coming forward, is there anything you think that, um, you know, listeners want to hear about in terms of any developments happening in Pembroke? Is there any infrastructure uh, happening in Pembroke that we should know about? Well, what we, we the council has decided is uh, we applied for a grant in regards to a new pool at the time when the federal government was providing uh, uh, grants and the province in regards to sporting facilities. And of course, we were turned down, but council made the decision Oh, I guess probably last December, we've got to go ahead because the, the uh, a aquatic uh, place is very important for our community and also the surrounding area. So we made the decision, let, let's, let's move ahead and hopefully, uh, you know, be able to, to get grants from the government, 
who knows with elections coming up and the budgets out there that there might be more money being made available uh, for uh, structures uh, such as the Aquatic Center. But we've made that decision. We've hired a management team, so we're slowly moving moving forward with that. So that's one thing uh, that we want to see. And, of course, um, our roads, the infrastructure, we have an awful lot of work you know, going on again this summer with, of course, which disrupts uh, the community. But things are, are moving ahead, so we haven't slowed down. We've been fortunate in, in, in the midst of this pandemic uh, none of our staff, our staff have been following all the rules of the game. So we've been very fortunate that we, we have not had a case of, of COVID. Mm-hmm. And I hope that continues. And I so hope we, are continues. Mo- we are moving ahead. I certainly hope it continues as well. Pembroke Mayor Michael LeMay, we always appreciate your time and we love the Ottawa Valley. So thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. Take care now. It's been a pleasure. When we come back, we're going to speak with Dr. Jeff Turnbull. Of course, he uh, he is really at the heart of the opioid crisis in this city. We're going to speak with him. And of course, remember, at the 10 o'clock hour, we're going to be speaking with Aaron O'Toole, Conservative leader, about a number of different topics. So stay with us here on City News. Well, we all loved our rock t-shirts growing up, right? It was our badge. Hey, we went to this concert. We knew that band inside out. So we, we kept doing that and kept promoting that. What's, what's sort of happening now is that audience is dying. <laughs> I always say the earth is flat. <laughs> so the 60s rockers are falling off the end of the earth. So you don't see as big a sales anymore because my audience is disappearing. What's sort of helping uh, to promote that history is the kids are buying vinyl. And luckily we have a vinyl shop in the neighborhood here, the record center. So what's happening is I've seen kids come in with their dad. And the dad said, hey, do you have any Beatles shirts? Do you have any CBGB? Do you have any of this? I said, well, why? Uh, you know, he said, well, because my daughter's into it. She's wearing my T-shirt. So slowly it's coming back, right? The kids are, I think, getting fed up with the generic music that's out there. And they want to click into something that, first of all, links them to their parents, something that they uh, thoroughly enjoy now. And maybe they're passing it on to their grandkids pandemic has been a couple of things definitely hard on everybody so much uh, uh, messaging that's out there that people don't understand stats every day Jesus Murphy like I'm getting a headache just reading this stuff right so so really it was just trying to understand where we were going to go from there the city of Ottawa all of a sudden said everybody's got to wear a mask you got to wear it on the bus people were scrambling okay and I had uh, the store next door had really big windows, so I just flooded the window with masks. Well, that was the, the activity that saved the business. Uh, people were coming in buying two, three, four masks at a time at 20 bucks a pop here. <laughs> but my masks were so different. They were the Rolling Stones, Beatles, Queen, all the pop culture. Everything else out there was medical masks. And right, so people said, oh, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to show my rock and roll. So it became the new, the new T-shirt, as far as I'm concerned. Well, what I've done, I'm Hintonburg. I'm at now at uh, 1114A Wellington Street, which is next door to the Fab Gear Store. And the reason I've changed names, I've rebranded the store, is because I was planning on retiring. And, and in December, I went, oh, I'm not going to retire, but I've committed to changing what the store is about. So I came up with a new name, Fab Gears Rock Shop, where legends are dressed, <laughs> and essentially get that message out. I prefer if the shirt don't fit, you come in, you try another one on. People like to feel the fabrics with clothing. It's amazing. You all come in and go, oh, I love that. Oh, can I try this? So that's the big difference. I'm not out to make a gazillion dollars. I stick the way I am, old school. I take cash, we take cards. Come on in and talk to the owner. Pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Thank you so much for joining us on this Tuesday, June 1st. I'm Sam LaPrade filling in for Rob Snow. 
Have you ever met someone that you think there's no way they do all that in 24 hours a day? They must have 48 hours in their day because they do so much for this city and have incredible impact on so many lives. Well, I've met that kind of person, and that is Dr. Jeff Turnbull. How are you, Dr. Turnbull? I'm very well, Sam. Thank you very much. Oh, it's true. I don't know how you do it all, and you've added something very exciting to your uh, to your work. And of course, that is uh, that is a, a school residency. I understand you're going to be a professor. Um, yes, this is uh, with what's called the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons um, of Canada. So. These are the people who are responsible for training standards for all specialists, whether you're a a kidney specialist or a cardiologist or whatever that might be. So they're the ones who are responsible for specialty care uh, and specialty training and standards. So um, I will be their professor in residence um, uh, and try and bring a message of the importance of community and being accountable to your community. Well, I can't tell you how relieved I am to know that the next generation will have that kind of training because you really have uh, had your career and that's been the heart of your career. And that applies definitely to this opioid crisis. And in many ways, the light has shined off of the opioid crisis because of COVID. Uh, We've spoke a number of times in the last 14 or 15 months. I'd like an update. Where are we at today, Dr. Turnbull? Well, they... um you're right. Uh, the, the opioid crisis continues uh, unabated. Um, we're, we're running at about 150% higher in the number of overdose deaths uh, in Canada uh, for this quarter compared to the last year's quarter. So uh, it, it continues without slowing down. The toxic drug supply is getting worse if anything people are avoiding uh, circumstances where they could inject safely so that puts them at additional risk so it continues um, so we have the the dual pandemic if you will or challenge of covid plus uh, overdose deaths Dr. Turnbull, are you seeing people, you've obviously been around, um, you know, people who are homeless for many, many years. You and I spent a lot of time together when I worked at the Ottawa Mission. Are you seeing people that you haven't seen before? Are you seeing new faces? Yeah. So what we've noticed in the context of COVID and this increase in overdose deaths, that we're seeing uh, younger people. Um, mostly male, um, but in their 20s. Whereas before the average um, population who were overdosing and dying were those people in their 30s. I mean, still way too young, but now it's younger people. And um, it's a very depressing development of seeing you know, people entering into the homeless environment and um, with mental health and addictions and overdose deaths when they're in their 20s. Like, it's it's a tragedy. Mm-hmm. It is always a tragedy. And I think when we think about addictions, we often, uh, many people are quick to judge. And I think, you know, it's 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 our brothers and sisters and, and, and mothers and fathers and uncles and aunts. I mean, these are family yeah. members. Of, of people that have obviously struggled. Uh, these are people, and sadly, and, and you and I both know this, these are people that lived in Canada, <laughs> that lived in yeah. Orleans. These are not people that, uh, you know, have have had uh, tough upbringings in many cases. Many cases it is that that way, but sometimes it's people that have fallen uh, victim to, uh, to addiction. What would you say to somebody that is, you know, maybe having a loved one that they see struggling in this way, and, and you don't want to see them uh, on the streets of Ottawa? Well, I would, Sam, I would say that I probably get that question every couple days of somebody who's, you know, got a loved one who's struggling with addiction and they're doing their very best um, to try and, you know, keep them from entering into the homeless environment or keep them safe. I think the the challenge is that there is addiction, but then there is addiction that is driven by underlying mental health. We see them running so closely together. And 
managing the problem um, involves both, uh, I think. So I think we have to be very cognizant if there's associate, associated mental health, let's get that treated. Um, if there's just addiction, well then what's the best strategy for that person? And what's the underlying cause of the addiction? Addiction is a symptom, I think, as opposed to a cause in itself. And people are often choosing addiction to, you know, deal with something um, else that's happened in their life. Mm -hmm. And so let's try and fix that. We're speaking with Dr. Jeff Turnbull, Director at Ottawa Inner City Health. Dr. Turnbull, when we think about your, you know, yourself as a doctor, we think about all the, the pressures you would have on you and then you layer on a pandemic. Uh, let's talk money. It's hard as a doctor to think about that, but, but if you were making budget choices, are there enough dollars going into mental health and addiction in this country? Um, no. <laughs> That's the easy. That's the easy answer. <laughs> yeah, Sam. You know, we we're spending that money. The the thing that I find difficult is that we are spending that money anyways. We're incarcerating people with high rates of mental health and addiction, and it's very expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, we're putting them in a shelter environment, very expensive. They're getting admitted to hospital where they get generally ineffective care very expensive so that money is being spent i think we cannot afford not to do the right thing so it's a matter of where the dollars are going basically the, you'll save money mm-hmm. you know if we get out and treat the underlying mental health challenge the addiction trouble you'll prevent these people from being incarcerated at sixty thousand dollars a year or in a hospital dead at twelve hundred dollars a day Dr. Turnbull, without using someone's name, and we only have about a minute, can you just tell me about someone that you've spent time with recently? Um, a homeless individual that is struggling? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I can. And, you know, the, this one sticks out very, very... I think about this individual pretty well daily because I think I failed this individual. This is a person who... We were um, uh, caring for, and this is a person on what we were providing an alternate for a toxic drug supply. The rules were that you cannot um, share your medications with others or deal those medications, and this person broke that rule, and I took that person off uh, safer supply, and he looked at me and said, you know, I'm going to die because of this. And I said, you know, I hear that a lot. You know, you'll be okay. You know, it's not forever, you know. And less than a week later, he had overdosed and died. And I think I failed that individual. And I think about it just about every day. Dr. Turnbull, thank you so much for sharing that. And I can tell you that uh, that is a heartbreaking story, but you have saved many, many lives in this city. And I realize that that's hard for you, that that one individual, but know that you've been impacted many, many people. Thank you for sharing, being brave today. I appreciate that very much. Always appreciate your time. Dr. Jeff Turnbull, Director at Ottawa Inner City Health. We are going to be going to speak with a professor uh, after this. And of course, Aaron O'Toole coming up after the 10 o'clock news. Stay with us here on City News.
Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Tuesday, June 1st. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 17 degrees. It's 18 in Smith Falls. And here's what's making news this hour. It's a major fire this morning in the West End at a Tomlinson facility on West Hunt Road. That's in Carp. That brought several fire crews to the scene. You're asked to avoid the area. Tomlinson has tweeted everybody is safe and also thanked Ottawa Fire for protecting the surrounding buildings. Several announcements expected from the province today, including school reopening to in-class learning or not. Also, the stay-at-home order, it expires tomorrow. The health minister says it looks like June 14th is when we hopefully move into phase one of reopening. There is also talk of a provincial cabinet shuffle. The federal government updating the vaccine protocol at noon today reports a second shot from a different vaccine maker is going to be approved then. And StatScan says the national economy grew in the first quarter at a rate of 5.6 percent. This follows the OECD. OECD prediction yesterday upping its forecast, saying Canada's economy would grow by 6.1 percent. That's through the entire year. City News Time 932. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. I'm Sam LaPratt filling in for Rob Snow on City News and of course Rogers TV. Thank you so much for tuning in. We wanted to speak with a professor, of course, Ian Lee, professor at the Sprott School of Business at Carleton University. Hello, professor. Uh, good morning, Sam. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Let's start our conversation today in the beautiful province of Newfoundland. There is quite a budget, my friend. There is indeed. There is indeed. The um, just the backdrop for for listeners because they may not, you know, it's a you know we're all in Ontario and we follow Ottawa and Ontario and that sort of thing. But uh, Newfoundland is, uh, without any doubt, and this is empirical data, is um, in by far and away the worst shape of any province or region uh, in all Canada. Um, they appointed um, Ms. Green, the former head of uh, the Royal Mail, and before that she was the head of Canada Post. And she's a native uh, born uh, from Newfoundland and Labrador, very successful executive, now retired. And she was uh, headed up a blue ribbon panel, just reported a couple of weeks ago, and did a comprehensive audit, if you will, on everything, not just the government of Newfoundland and Labrador, but the Crown Corporations and any uh, organizations that were uh, co-signed or backed up or supported by Newfoundland and Labrador, in other words, the Crowns. And this province, with 500,000 people, that's half the size of Ottawa in terms of people, owes $47 billion. Just for contrast, and I know Ottawa, the city of Ottawa is not a province, we all know that, but there's a lot of people getting very upset that because the city of Ottawa is approaching $3 billion in long-term debt. Mm-hmm. $3 billion. Well, Newfoundland and Labrador owns, owes $47 billion. Now, quite a bit of that is crown corporations, so even if you just look at the debt of Newfoundland and Labrador proper, just the narrow government itself, it's a, a mere $25 billion, $25 billion wow. for, half a, for 500,000 people. And so the province is insolvent. And I didn't say bankrupt because that's a legal, has a legal meaning under the Bankruptcy Act. Insolvency is defined as unable to make, pay, make, your, pay, make your payments on your debts as they become due. That test is used for people and for corporations and for agencies. So if you can't make your payments as they become due, that's one definition of insolvency. Well, Newfoundland and Labrador is dependent on the bond market because it's garnering chronic deficits. And before COVID, just before COVID, uh, the bond market said, look, we're just not going to buy your bonds anymore. You're just so deeply in debt. And, and so the, uh, the commission that was a uh, blue ribbon commission uh, r- did a full report saying, you've got to turn this around very dramatically. Okay, to the budget now, very quickly. Did they do it? 
No, they didn't. Mm -hmm. And when you read through the budget, their deficit is down. Say, hey, look at that. Isn't that magical? They're doing what uh, the the blue ribbon panel uh, suggested. They're 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 they they cut the deficit in half. Isn't that clever? Well, no, no. <laughs> what happened was oil revenues have gone up. Uh, dramatically, because the price of oil, as we all know, for those of us filling up our cars, we've seen the price of gas right. go up, and that's because oil prices are up. Brent is up. Brent, the price wants one of the measures of oil, and others, West Texas Intermediate, WTI, they're all going up uh, dramatically, and so oil has now got revenues, are now gushing back into the uh, Newfoundland Labrador. By the way, this province is dependent on oil and gas for 25% of its GDP, of its provincial GDP. Oh, I didn't realize that. It's very large, and mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not faulting that. I mean, you know, take your money where you find it. You know, mm -hmm. if the money comes in, grab it. But where, where I'm going with this, Ms. Green said, governments in the past always said, well, we'll deal with the problem next year. We won't do the cuts this year because it's just things are, you know, it's a very special time and can't really ha handle it this year, but we'll start next year. Well, the budget did exactly the same thing that they've done in the past. They announced, they said, this is a, a major turnaround, they said, and we're really, a, the budget was called Change Starts Here. And then they announced in the budget that the cuts will start this year. No, 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 not this year next year and i predict that next year when the finance minister stands up in this line of labrador they're going to say oh covid this post covid that we'll start it next year that's 2023 <laughs> and then they'll just keep kicking it down the road and so they haven't come to terms with the insolvency they're 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 overextended they have too much uh i mean they, they they one of the problems is demography a lot of the young people are leaving and another problem is is their spending is not has not been brought under control and this is not a partisan statement because the conservative opposition and the ndp opposition condemned this new the government this new liberal government of Atlanta labrador for even discussing the possibility of cuts next year not this year there are none so i do not believe that as atlanta labrador has solved this problem it has not confronted its its insolvency so when I think about Newfoundland, obviously, I think a lot about tourism. I mean, obviously, uh, 2020, they would have taken a, a large um, uh, a large hit uh, in terms of tourism. And of course, in 2021 as well. How much does that play into this story? It's tourism not going to save Newfoundland and Labrador because, uh, and by, by the way, it's a beautiful place. Let's be very, very clear. Those ads were stunning. We've all seen on television. They've won awards. And, and I've been, uh, unfortunately, only to the capital city. I was planning a trip um, to go back for two weeks, a road trip all through. And it got canceled because of an illness and an immediate member of my family. And I had to cancel literally before we were just before we got on the plane. And so I never got back yet. Uh, but the, the images are spectacular. But the idea that they're going to save uh, and generate billions and billions of dollars is not going to happen. Uh, Ms. Green did spell out a long-term plan, and it involves selling off Crown Corporations. Uh, they need desperately need some due diligence and some tough decision-making. The, the Crown Corporations are bloated, uh, overstaffed, losing money. Uh, they propose getting rid of them. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of things they're going to have to do to rein in their spending, uh, decrease the... Um, for example, they're subsidizing Memorial University. Um, they're giving them additional money beyond the base subsidy that every university gets to keep their uh, tuition fees uh, frozen at a very low level, at a very, very low level. They're much lower there than, for example, in Ontario. But, so, Professor, if they're going to be uh, sort of cutting a lot of those jobs, are they not sort of cutting off their nose to spite their face? Are they going to also then see, obviously, you know, a, a big impact to the, to the job market? She wasn't actually saying go lay off lots of people. Um, some of it is, um, uh, I mean, you'd have to go through the report. It's a very detailed report, like the Don Drummond report of 10 years right. ago for Ontario. And there's many, many moving parts. And it wasn't uh, a cold shock therapy where, you know, they said to go lay off everybody or half of everybody overnight. It was an incremental plan that involved tax increases, uh, it's, although it's already very highly taxed, and it involved... Uh, an incremental reduction of expenditures. I think a lot of it was going to be achieved through um, through uh, attrition. Um, but at the end of the day, to put it as bluntly as I can, they're living beyond their means. They're spending more than they're bringing in. 
And you can say to some, I say, well, what's wrong with that? Federal government's doing it. Yes, the federal government is doing it, but the federal government has a much broader tax base, vastly broader. Um, it taxes many more things. And most importantly, sovereign governments, including the government of Canada, has a printing press. It's called the Bank of Canada. I don't mean that flippantly or sarcastically, and I'm not going to go into the economics of it. For those who are interested, just Google it. Central banks can actually create money in the thin air. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't believe me, just go Google it. But central banks can actually print money. Provincial governments do not have a printing press. They literally have to go to real bond markets, and bond markets are pension funds, uh, wealthy individuals who want to buy some government bonds. Uh, they can be corporations with surplus cash on their balance sheet, but they're real people or real companies or real institutions called pension funds that have real money to buy real bonds. And if the bond market says, look, we're just not buying your bonds anymore, which is what's happened, then you have to find a bailout. Well, because COVID, it just, for, I mean, I, I don't mean this in any nasty way, but Newfoundland and Labrador was really fortunate in a weird way that COVID hit just at the time that the bond markets were backing out mm -hmm. and refusing to buy their bonds. Because what happened was the Bank of Canada then announced it was going to, as part of its COVID liquidity assistance to help the economy, it said, okay, we're going to start buying bonds across Canada uh, of provincial governments. And so that's how what saved um, Newfoundland and Labrador. Now, in the short run, that can happen. But I think if you read any of these uh, economists and experts on this, including people like David Dodge, the former governor of the Bank of Canada, knows a little bit about it, this is not a permanent solution. Mm -hmm. The Central Bank of Canada cannot be literally buying the bonds of, a, of an insolvent province, sign a die forever. Sign a die meaning for in, in definitely forever. And so there's going to have to be some kind of a restructuring uh, that's going to have to occur, I think, or alternatively, they're going to have to look at something more radical, and I've advocated this for a long time, and I'm told I'm crazy, uh, which is that um, Maritime Union uh, put the four provinces together um, to become a bigger entity, and I'm talking New Brunswick, PEI, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland and Labrador. Right. Now I know that's anathema to many people, but you know they're they're running into the they're running out of runway, and they're about to hit the proverbial wall. Mm -hmm. And in the short run, we can subsidize them for sure, but I don't believe that that's a solution from now until the end of time. Right. I mean, there has to be something done. Obviously, let's yeah. switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. We understand uh, that many feel that the COVID nineteen spending was really tilted to those high earning Canadians. What are your thoughts, Ian? Well, I won't even tell you it's my thought. How about empirical data? Uh, this is uh, from Stats Canada. This is hard data. It's not an opinion. It's not a theory. It's a hard data point that the top 20%, uh, the top quintile, sorry for the jargon, but stats can, like every other statistic, major statistical agency, divides up the economy into quintiles. Uh, now, these are individuals, not companies. So every one of us, um, we have a certain salary. We know what we make because we file a tax return. Right. And the top 20% um, of income are in the top quintile. <laughs> so if you're, you know, uh, 200,000 a year, you're in the top 20%. Uh, and then the next 20% and so on, down to the bottom 20%, which is the bottom quintile, which is what we colloquially call the poor or the poorest. Um, and the top quintile are what we colloquially call the rich. And uh, it turned out that the top 20%, the wealthiest Canadians in Canada, received the most amount of money from emergency COVID assistance programs. Isn't that astonishing? They got, I mean, first off, the question I want to ask is, what on earth were we doing giving any money, one single penny, to somebody in the top 20% of income? And it reminds me again, and I'm, I'm, I'm not changing the subject, but I've made this argument uh, frequently that when you unpack policies that are advocated by progressive governments like Mr. Trudeau, you often find that the, the biggest beneficiaries are the wealthiest people, the most privileged people. Look at the Canada Post decision when they said, look, we're going to stop the termination of home delivery. And they did in the urban core across Canada where the wealthiest people live and the wealthiest postal codes. 20% of the country still gets, I think it's 20%, 15, 20%, still get home delivery. 
full disclosure, I'm one of them, and I don't deserve it. And out in the burbs and everywhere else, 75% of Canadians have to go to a community mailbox. Well, what they did with that decision is made sure that the most privileged people, the wealthiest people in Canada, you know, in the downtown urban core, the wealthy homes of Toronto and Vancouver and Montreal and Ottawa and elsewhere, continue to get uh, home delivery to their front door, whereas everyone else uh, has to go to a community mailbox. I'm not against community mailbox. I'm just saying that the highest income people got the benefit. Here with COVID, the highest income people got the most amount of money. Mm -hmm. And it, you got to ask a question, what on earth were they doing? And people, when they say, well, you know, we had to act quickly, we didn't know, this is, this is bogus. I'm sorry, it's bogus, because the CRA, Canada Revenue Agency, has unbelievable data. They have the biggest database in Canada that is, if far exceeds any other database, including CSIS, on us. Why? Because every 13 million of us, we the Canadian people, us, file tax returns annually telling them how much we make, where we live, whether we're married, separated, divorced, have children, whether we're a homeowner, whether we're a renter. Right. They have an incredible database. Mm -hmm. And my point being that they can pull it up instantly and, 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 you know, and provide the data and advice to the government about who is high income. And they could have targeted that money using CRA through a negative income tax. Mm -hmm. and, and so they could have avoided by saying using CRA's incredible system of computers. And remember, every employer in Canada, private and public, must file on the 16th of every month a statement to CRA with the money of the withholding taxes and listing the SIN number and the name of every person on the payroll, right, not right. just companies. Carlton right. University has to do that. Right, right. So on the 16th of every month, those computers know every last name of every last person on every payroll in all Canada. So they knew who were the high income people, who's the low income people, and they could use that data to say, okay, we're going to distribute money and make sure it doesn't go to the top three quintiles or the top 60%. And they didn't, and they ended up giving uh, the uh, disproportionate amount to the wealthiest people who needed the help the least, like okay. Universal Pharmacare, which right. is to give free drugs to high-income people. Let's come back, because we've got lots to talk about. Ian Lee, Professor Sprott School of Business. Let's take a quick break here on City News. Well, we're celebrating our 43rd year. It's still family operated, we're in our second generation. We, uh, pre-COVID, we're at about a thousand employees. We have 20 stores from coast to coast in Canada. Uh, we do our own manufacturing. Uh, we, uh, right here in Ottawa, we have about 160 people that support Canadian made manufacturing in addition to our retail stores. Taking you back to mid-March and the impact of uh, the pandemic on Lee Valley, Lee Valley was actually in a tough spot. We had just launched our website a few months prior to that, and we were going through you know, a fairly typical deployment dive where your customers retract as they adjust to the website. And then uh, under stress already, this pandemic hit. And uh, in the early days, you know, it was pretty critical. It hit us really hard. Stores were closed. Um, you know, we weren't sure what to do, so we had to go right into survival mode. As a result, uh, you know, we uh, had to take our workforce almost back to half of where we were at because the stores were closed and with 20 stores, that's a, a big retail workforce. Um, but what we were able to do pretty quickly with a little luck being essential, selling tools and hardware, uh, we were able to uh, adjust our business model, uh, you know, with um, respect to the stores and our fulfillment operation. Uh, that new website that we were under stress worked out well for us because as the world was under house arrest, uh, people were looking to online and uh, the conversion uh, to our online sales in some cases almost doubled. And we saw tremendous interest in uh, things to do at home. Where we were lucky once again is, uh, and fortunate is that our product offering, you know, work at home tools, craft, hobbies, backyard, container, uh, gardening, you name it, what we sold was really appealing to people. With respect to our stores, uh, Lee Valley, you know, a, a rare unknown fact was that we were one of the pioneers of curbside pickup. We've been doing it for 25 years. Pretty much dove right into uh, the, ap the application to help with the contactless shopping right away. We took the uh, application, 
And it's not like an Apple application where you have to download it to your phone and clutter up your phone. This is literally resides right on our website. So you walk into our store with your phone, you pull up our website, and there's a little scan icon. You just tap that, select your store, off you go. You go through the showroom, you scan product, you can read more about it, you can check the on hand, you can add it to your cart, continue to shop, and when you're ready, you just submit it to the counter. We'll go pick it for you. We'll call out your name, we'll check you out, send you on your way. You haven't touched anything. It's completely safe, and it's using a device you're comfortable with and a website that you're familiar with. Amazingly, nine out of 10 people that used it, loved it and want to use it again. Strong opinions. Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Thank you so much for staying with us here on City News. I'm Sam LaPrade filling in for Rob Snow. And of course, we always have the professor in the house, Ian Lee. Ian, let's talk about elections. We know that uh, we are probably on the fringe of an election. Any predictions for us? You mean you're referring now, of course, federally and federally, Canada. of course, yes. Um, I'm going to give a and, and forgive me for my sort of almost stream of consciousness rambling. It's not rambling. I, I'm going to I'm going to sound though like I'm really contradicting myself. On the one hand, um, a lot of people are assuming that Mr. Trudeau is sailing to a, a victory and probably a majority victory, and one part of me thinks that's true also, and then another part of me says, well, wait a minute, if you look at the polls consistently for the last 12 months, and I use the last 12 months because that's COVID, really from March until now, so a little over 12 months, he's been running three, four, five points ahead of the Conservatives. Now, my way of thinking about this is if you've given out almost a trillion dollars in 12 months, good God in heaven, you should be at 85 or 90 percent in the public opinion polls. I mean, people should be so grateful. They should be, you know, prostate on the ground. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Trudeau. And the fact that he's struggling, let's use the right word. People say, oh, look at that, he's ahead of the Conservatives. My goodness gracious, he's only three or four points ahead. Maybe five, maybe two. But he's given out almost a trillion dollars. That's 50% of the totality of GDP in Canada. I mean, these are numbers never before seen in the history of Canada. And he's only, and I mean only, two or three or four points ahead. And people out there listening can quibble with me and say, no, Ian, it's 4.7%. Okay, okay, I'll go along with that. My question is, why isn't he triple, double digits ahead? Why isn't he at 75% or 65% or how about just plain old fashioned 50%? And he is mired, mired back down in the mid 30s. So where am I going with this? It tells me that significant, large, meaning significant, large, numbers of Canadians have some very serious misgivings about Mr. Trudeau's leadership. And I think that they're suffering right now, pardon the academic jargon here, but they're suffering a bit of cognitive dissonance. On the one hand, they kind of like what's been going on, you know, and nobody, didn't, nobody went over the cliff, nobody went into abject poverty, the economy didn't collapse, so we're, you know, that's happy, we're happy about that. The vaccinations, although they were screwed up very badly, they're finally rolling out, and lots of us are getting our vaccine, I've got mine, and lots of others have too. I think we're up to 50% now in Ontario. So, on the one hand, people are happy about that, they're not angry about that. On the other hand, there's this, I think there's this sense gnawing in the back of their mind, that little voice in our head saying, you know, uh, there's something just not right here. And who's going to pay all this back? Right. And am I going to get hit with a whacking big tax increase if we do give him the keys with a majority government? Is he going to come after my house with a, with a capital gains tax on my house to pay back all this money? Like, what, what's, what's going to happen? And, and because they're not leveling with us, 
they're not. I mean, they're just not talking about this. They're saying, in fact, they even said, we can't talk about that right now. We're focused on, you know, the COVID recession. We're not even in a recession, by the way. We're growing at 6% a year. A recession is negative GDP growth, and we're doing gangbuster Chinese-level GDP growth. Right. We are not in a COVID recession. I completely categorically, uh, empirically, factually disagree with Ms. Freeman on this, Fre- Freeland on this, but they're refusing to say, you know, people, <laughs> we owe just gargantuan amounts of money mm-hmm. and uh, we're, there's a day of reckoning coming. Those words have not crossed the lips of anyone in the cabinet. And yet there's lots of intelligent Canadians who know that that's just, that's a, a mm-hmm. pipe dream. That's just nonsense. Let that's me ask you this. Snake oil. Let me ask you this. Let's do lightning round, okay? So I'm going to ask you a question, really quick answers, okay? Yep. So when do you think the election's going to be, if you had to pick a date? <sighs> you see, I, I, I think it keeps receding for one reason. I'm sorry for not giving you a short, quick answer. He's because he's not breaking into the 40s. Mm-hmm. And he realizes he's when you're only three or four points away, that's not a big swing. And that's why I think they keep postponing. It's nothing to do with the balance of power in the House of Commons. They're looking for good, solid numbers that say that they are will ensure that when they call the election, they will get their majority. And right now, I think that there's a lot, they understand the misgivings, they see the numbers, they're polling every night, I think, and they see these numbers, and they know they do not have a majority in the bag. Okay. So they keep postponing that decision in behind closed doors, because they're waiting for the numbers to go up to the point, I think, high 30s, high 30s, okay. like 38, so, 39, 40 consistently, and they are not there. Okay. So that means they won't have an election until they feel confident that they can win, which might not even be this fall. Okay, interesting. Okay, so we're going to go with that. So l- last question. We literally have 30 seconds. I'm going to be speaking with Aaron O'Toole, leader of the Conservative uh, Party of Canada, in a couple of minutes. What's the one question you would ask him, Ian? Um, he's got to, why haven't you carved out a very uniquely different, I'm not talking carbon tax, and I'm not talking social policy, on the things that are most uh, unpopular with Mr. Crudeau, and that's the progressive virtue signaling and, and the challenges about what are we going to do when we cut off uh, oil and gas or make it prohibitively expensive for millions of people who heat their homes. Mm-hmm. I wish he would focus on these very tough questions. And the second question is, what is he his vision for post-COVID uh, uh, concerning the spending okay, and the budget excellent. deficit. Excellent. Always appreciate uh, your time. Of course, Ian Lee, professor at the Sprott School of Business at Carleton University. Coming up, Aaron O'Toole, leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. Stay with us here on City News.
local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Tuesday, June 1st. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 17 degrees. It's 18 in Smith Falls, and here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Fire crews remain on scene of a major blaze this morning on West Hunt Road. That is just north of Richardson Side Road around Carp. The fire in a large commercial building owned by Tomlinson, uh, that company did tweet, all staff are safe, but ask you to avoid the area. West Honda is closed at Carp, and the 417 uh, westbound ramp to Carp Road also closed. You can expect delays in that area. Latest numbers of COVID infections in the province, 699. That is the lowest case count in months. 39 of these new cases are in Ottawa. There are two more cases in Renfrew, but zero in Leeds Grenville Lanark and the Eastern Ontario Health Unit. Now, Queen's Park is expected to be very busy today with COVID announcements and decisions. We get the latest from Alex Bloomfield. Plenty of reasons for speculation out of Queen's Park today. A couple of announcements have been promised. Uh, one on the fate of in-person learning, perhaps another providing clarity on the public health measures that will be in place uh, between the expiry of the stay-at-home order at midnight tonight and step one of reopening. So we have some things in place there and we'll be outlining those more in more detail in the days coming up. That was Dr. David Williams yesterday. Right now, it seems the rules from the emergency break period back in early April will be in place, but it's clear as mud. Now, we'll also get today's COVID-19 case count. Early indications, the ICU count uh, looking good. Critical Care Ontario reporting a drop in occupancy of 33 patients today, uh, down to 584. I'm Alex Bloomfield. City News Time at 10.02. Now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. For Ottawa, the Valley and Smith Falls today, we'll get into some clearing. Generally sun and cloud today, the high 26 degrees. Tonight, mainly clear in 12. And tomorrow, sunshine, rain moves in overnight Wednesday for Thursday morning. And the high tomorrow, 27. For today, the high, 26. And right now in Ottawa, 17 degrees, it's 18 degrees in Smith Falls. There will be a take note debate in Parliament today on the recent discovery of the remains of 215 children on the grounds of a former Kamloops, B.C. Indian residential school. It's a process that allows MPs to give their thoughts before government makes a decision. Indigenous leaders demanding more than speeches in Parliament. Assembly of First Nations National Chief Perry Belgard says it's time for the Liberals to immediately dedicate more resources, both financial and human, and fully investigate all Indigenous child deaths at residential schools. City crews in Charlottetown have taken down a controversial statue of Canada's first Prime Minister. The action this morning followed the vote yesterday by Charlottetown Council. They permanently removed the Sir John A. Macdonald statue from a downtown intersection as response to the recent Recent revelations about the residential school system. Now, council had been planning to improve signage and add an indigenous figure to the McDonald statue, instead deciding to remove it entirely following the discovery last week of the remains of those 215 children. This could be a picture-perfect summer across the country. Weather Network Chief Meteorologist Chris Scott warns warm, dry conditions could lead to an active forest fire season, especially in the B.C. interior. Depending on how much rain falls this month, agricultural regions of the prairies could see droughts. Scott says Ontario and Quebec can expect average temperatures for the most part and that it'll be warm in Atlantic Canada, with average rainfall in Newfoundland and Labrador, but more precipitation than normal in the Maritimes. Don Kelly, the Canadian press. Toronto. And I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613 750 1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. Thank you so much for joining us. We do want to hear from you. We're going to be taking calls a little bit later in the show. But first up, we have Aaron O'Toole, leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. Hi, Aaron. How are you? Good morning, Sam. I'm well. Thank you so much for joining us. We know how busy you are. We're going to talk about lots of different things today, but I understand you have an opposition day motion. Talk to me about this motion. What is this going to mean for Canadians? Well, we're demanding some action from the Trudeau government to release documents related to quite a scandal they've been trying to cover up. The fact that there were 
two scientists with deep links to the Chinese military that somehow gained access to our secure laboratory in, in Winnipeg and in 2019 transferred serious and dangerous viruses to the Wuhan lab in China and the Ebola and some other viruses. How did this happen? How was this security breach um, finally uncovered? We've been asking for this information for some time from the Trudeau government. They've been covering it up, trying to, to delay and avoid disclosure. So today we're, we're demanding this because the world is now looking at where was the origin of the, of the coronavirus? Was there any link at all to the Wuhan lab? I think we just have to be part of the transparency in this. And Mr. Trudeau's always been offside on China a bit, and we, we have some serious questions now. So, Aaron, what do you say? A number of critics are, are indicating that maybe you're chasing a conspiracy theory with this inquiry, that you're just kind of looking for things to talk about. Well, if he released the documents, he could clear this up really quickly. I think the only time a conspiracy theory has started is when someone's avoiding answering reasonable questions. A few years ago, I created the China-Canada Committee so that we could have a serious look on issues, everything from Huawei and 5G to the human rights situation with, with the Uyghurs, the situation in Hong Kong. Mr. Trudeau has been offside on all these issues. He didn't even show up for the vote, recognizing a, a genocide taking place against the Uyghur minority population. So we've been asking these questions in, in that specialized committee, and they're avoiding uh, discussing. We don't even know the status of those scientists. Were they, were, you know, are they citizens? Were they permanent residents? Were they granted temporary access to, to the lab. Why was that done? So these are reasonable questions that I think Canadians want us, want us to ask. There's a lot of reports about uh, communist China's espionage efforts in, in Canada. We can't be naive like Mr. Trudeau, who, 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 who would like to see China as, it, as he'd love it to be, as opposed to how it really is. Okay, at the end of the day, you're going to table this motion. What action are you expecting the House to take on this motion? Well, the House of Commons, and this is one great thing, Sam, about our democracy, is the, the government cannot hide from being accountable. And so our parliament, a historic right we have is that MPs can receive documents in order to do our job to ask pertinent questions for the country. In this case, the security of Canadians, uh, the, the potential breaches of, of international security. And if Mr. Trudeau refuses, he, he would be in contempt of parliament. And we've seen this before. Uh, a decade ago, there were questions about Afghan uh, detainees during the Afghanistan war. And at that time, the Conservatives were in, in power, and there was a demand for documents. There were security concerns, but security concerns can be addressed without uh, usurping the ability for MPs to do their job. It's our democratic right to ask the tough questions. We saw with the cover-up of, of military sexual harassment, they, they've, they've covered that up. They blocked the committee structure. Mr. Trudeau does this on all counts, just hides from accountability. And I think Canadians deserve, deserve truth and deserve clarity, especially when it comes to our, our public and national security. Speaking about tough questions, we know, uh, Mr. O'Toole, that uh, the last week it was absolutely devastating for Canadians, for the Indigenous community, to know that 215 children lost their lives at a residential school in Kamloops, B.C. Speaking about tough subjects, that's a tough one. What tough questions are you going to ask? Well, that's a, a, a good point, Sam. And in fact, I'm trying to, to take the politics out of this. We need to, to show Canadians that reconciliation uh, includes living up to our commitment to look into the missing children. There are several recommendations that came in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report. So yesterday, I wrote Prime Minister Trudeau and said, the Conservative opposition will work swiftly with the government to move on all of those recommendations. Uh, basically to give families some closure, to, to help communities even identify um, um, these, these horrific cases and, and families impacted, and look at that other residential schools. This was an issue that was raised, Sam, in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report. It's time for action. Six years ago, Mr. Trudeau said he was implementing all the calls to action and has really done very, very little. So this is important to me as a, as a parliamentarian, but also as a parent. 
definitely as a parent, I, I think it's just heartbreaking. I think uh, everybody sort of hugged their kids just a little bit harder in the last number of days. Uh, we know, as you alluded to, uh, this is 215 uh, children. We've heard upwards of 4,000 children that were missing during those residential uh, school days. And we know, I mean, let, let's be honest, this is genocide. This was Those residential schools were still happening uh, in the 90s. So this isn't that long ago in our history. So we need to obviously tackle this today. We can lower flags. We can do all of that. But we really need action. Uh, what action are you going to take uh, as you sort of work through this uh, with, with the, um, with of course, the government today? No, it's a great point. And, you know, probably the most important conversation I had was with my nine-year-old son when he asked why the flags were at half-mast. And, and I had to tell him that 215 children were found in a mass grave in, in Kamloops. And, and he knows about residential schools. And he said to me, you know, Dad, kids aren't supposed to die at school. Gosh, sometimes the moral clarity of a nine-year-old reminds us that we have to we have to act. So I said to the government, we will move swiftly with them on on those recommendations, 71 to 76. We'd also like to uh, expedite the passage of Bill C-8, which would incorporate the treaty commitments uh, to our First Nations as part of the citizenship oath. I think all Canadians need to take a role, a part in reconciliation. My first question, Sam, as a leader of the opposition, was on reconciliation, was on a truth and reconciliation uh, report or call to action on, on health. I'm watching the, the, uh, the inquiry into the terrible death of Joyce Echaquan in Quebec closely as well. So this will be a priority for me, and I think the more Canadians get to know me and my leadership of the Conservatives, I want action. Mr. Trudeau is very good at, at words and, and showing you know sympathy. But reconciliation means restoring trust. It means delivering. It means not just promising about boil water advisories, but but living up to those commitments. And on on the missing children piece and and the need to give clarity and, and closure to families and communities, this is something I'll move swiftly on. And we also know, of course, uh, 1,100, 1,200 missing and murdered Indigenous women as well. I think it, you know I, I think there's this is a this is a very uh, important topic for all of us. Let let me ask you this, uh, Aaron, is it hard to get attention in a pandemic as the leader of the opposition? Is this a hard thing for you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's the quick but, answer. <laughs> no, listen, you know, everyone is understandably looking at COVID, like even my own kids. So when, when is this going to be over, Dad? And, you know, parents are stressed, you know, especially Canadians that have been impacted, small business owners. I, I've seen, you know, appeals from some of them. It's heartbreaking, the health and economic toll. So my focus is on, on getting us through that, tackling the issues. I'm not focused on an election and, and getting better known. I think when people take a look at Mr. Trudeau's record versus my record in public life, in the military, in the private sector, I think it's time to have a serious leader, someone who's going to deliver and get things done. That's not Mr. Trudeau. We've had we've had five, six years of nothing getting done. Um, so as people get to know me, I, I think they'll see it's time for, for a positive change and and great conversations with people like you, Sam, is part of it. Well, let me ask you this, a bit of a selfish question. <laughs> I have a first dose of AstraZeneca, and we know, of course, the advice um, of the table is that Canadians need to uh, get that second dose. Uh, the recommendation was not AstraZeneca. Now it is AstraZeneca. Now we're extending it by a month. Where do you sit on that, Aaron? <laughs> the confusion sowed by the federal government because you'd had PHAC, you had Minister Hyju, you have Justin Trudeau, you have NASI, and a few weeks ago or a month ago, they were all contradicting themselves within the span of 24 hours. And the three tools in the pandemic I've always said we have are vaccines, rapid tests, and information. So I've been very clear. I, I had COVID last last fall, and, and my wife and I fortunately recovered. We, we had mild cases. We've had the AstraZeneca dose, and when appropriate, I'd be more than happy to get another. Um, I don't think I'd be a priority group given my health and the fact that, that I fought COVID. We just need vaccines. We needed them in January, February, March to avoid the second wave. Mr. Trudeau didn't secure those, didn't secure the border from variants. And so we've got a much worse third wave than other countries. So as people get the chance to get a vaccine, get vaccinated, because that will finally let us start turning the corner in, in this COVID uh, crisis. 
We're speaking with Aaron O'Toole, leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. Every single listener at City News is screaming into their radio, Sam, ask him about the election. Is there going to be an election this year? And do you want an election? <laughs> Well, Sam, you'll have to get Justin Trudeau on after me to ask him that question. He's been the one posturing for an election since last fall. The Wee scandal, he prorogued Parliament. That prevented him from going last fall. He was telling his own party that he was going in May and June. Their their failure on vaccines prevented that. I have always said, Sam, we need to turn the corner in COVID before we start thinking of votes. And we needed vaccines months ago. We don't need votes. At the appropriate time, Canadians will be able to assess Mr. Trudeau's poor performance in in COVID, the economic challenges we face, which are immense, the fact that he's looking at taxing home equity, he's going to do anything to pay for his out-of-control spending, and the, the China issue we're raising today, these all relate to, is Mr. Trudeau's judgment, is his ethical conduct appropriate to lead our country? And... I think sometime after COVID, Canadians will get the chance to to choose what path they want to take. I've said it uh, once, I've said it a hundred times during COVID. I can't imagine being the leader of anything during this time. Uh, You know, a lot of pressure on leaders to make decisions. When you put your head on your pillow at night, what's your biggest fear, Aaron? Um, My biggest fear is not living up to why I'm in politics, which is for my kids. As I said, I had to talk about residential schools with my son, Jack, who's nine, and my daughter, Molly, is 14. I want to make sure that they have a chance to buy a home, that they're not saddled with you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of debt, that Canada is free, prosperous, has our liberties, and we're respected on the world stage. So it, it's why I'm in politics. And I'll tell you right now, with, with the housing crisis, with, with inflation coming up, interest rate uh, increases on the horizon, a half trillion dollars of new debt accumulated, I'm really worried about us giving them a, a poorer Canada with fewer opportunities. So I'm going to fight to reverse that. I have uh, really enjoyed my time with you today. I really appreciate uh, your uh, your thoughts on all those topics. I wish you well and uh, and hope we get to talk again soon. I hope so too. Have a great day, Sam. Thanks, Aaron. Aaron O'Toole, leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. We've heard from him, of course. Now we want to hear from you. So certainly call us 613-750-1310. It is the Talk Back Hour. We're going to have a little fun when Rob's away. I'm Sam LaPrade here on City News. Everyone's got their own little dreams. I want to write the next novel. I want to write a screenplay, which I still want to do. (laughs) Um, So owning my own business is something I've always, in the back of your mind, oh yeah, that'd be really cool to try and do. Um, I end up, uh, lost my job that I had for 20 years. And I found myself with nothing. (laughs) Uh, Trying to figure out what am I going to do now? I'm mid 40s and you know I got a lot of different experience mainly in retail so I figured you know what uh, let's try to give this a go um, I didn't really have any money I started up with the little website uh, we went with that and then it just kind of it's kind of just grown from there um, you know I, I have such a passion for this it's not even work for me uh, this is a hobby that I get to you know, thankfully make a living off of. When you walk in, you're going to be uh, overwhelmed, I think, uh, with all the amount of uh, licensed product that we have. Um, I only sell licensed product. Um, I don't sell anything, no name or anything. Everything is 100% officially licensed, uh, depending on the franchise. Um, So I like to support a lot of different franchises, a lot of pop culture. So I do have a little bit of music. Uh, vinyl, uh, Star Trek, Star Wars, uh, Marvel, DC, uh, Doctor Who, Game of Thrones, you know, you name it, there's probably something around, or if, it, if I don't have it, you let me know, and I'll do whatever I can to, you know, try and find it for you. I do some comic books. Uh, a lot of the interesting things that I do are items that you just don't find anywhere else. I probably have the best selection of pop culture cookbooks. 
So cookbooks from Walking Dead and Downton Abbey and uh, Orange is the New Black, Hannibal, Marvel, Wonder Woman. I've got the best selection of Star Trek ships in the city. Well, actually, I've got the best selection in the country. Um, I'm the uh, only retailer in Canada that deals directly with the company Eagle Moths. Um, I've got the best variety of Pop Funko figures within the city. I got the best prices, hands down. Um, even some of my action figures that I sell that are available at Walmart and Toys R Us, I, I'm cheaper than them, <laughs> which is a lot of thing. Well, a lot of times you, you don't realize it. So even that small business can offer you a great value. Sam LaPrade. It is the Talk Back Hour. Of course, Rob Snow takes your calls every single day. I'm here today. I'm hoping you're going to call us today. 613-750-1310. And we have Roger on the line from Ottawa. Uh, good from, morning, sir. From Drummond. I'm sorry, Roger. How are you? That's okay. I'm fine. How are you? Good, good. It's a pleasure to listen to you. And uh, and, and there was a nice, uh, a nice interview you had with... Um, uh, Aaron O'Toole, and of course, uh, Mr. Lee is always a pleasure. Thank you. Um, what I want to talk about is two things. Uh, we know how much debt that this government is, is impaled on to our future generations. Like I'm 66 years old. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be on the other side of the sod pretty soon, but I, I've been involved in politics most of my life and working with federal and provincial conservative parties. Uh, I put out signs. I, I use hundreds of dollars in gas, never asked for one cent. And the only thing I care about is my community my province and my country and more or less the future of future generations uh, this is one of the best countries in the world uh, we've uh, punched well above our weight in our past we have a government that just cer is certainly doing everything they can to destroy all the good things in this country and two things i wanted to talk about was the energy situation like um we're going to get off of oil someday but not today not tomorrow and not next week probably in several decades but we're gonna get there just like everything else that humanity has had to deal with we found a way to overcome it and we can talk about many wars pandemics and everything and we still got through it I always believe that humanity is has the strength to endure as long as we're in the right path and the right path is to make sure everybody is not nobody's left behind that deserves not to be and this country, uh, instead of dividing it from one region to the other and pitting uh, Canadians against Canadians, I want this country to be united. It hasn't been united since, well, I'll go back to the Kretcher era, too. And he did everything he could to divide this country so that he can continue staying in power. Mr. Trudeau's doing the same thing. And like Ian Lee said about the amount of money that, uh, that he spent so far, well, there should be a pot, a chicken in every pot, and everybody should have a nice new pony. You know, but we but we got nothing but debt and very little to show for it. It is very scary, certainly. And of course, Aaron O'Toole alluded to it as well in terms of, you know, he's thinking about his children and, and the debt that they're going to to incur, of course, for years now, to come. Now, now, you know something, Sam, how do you afford a house? Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you and, and you were talking about that yesterday with uh, with uh, with one of your uh, interviewers. I don't know which one, but it was you, Frank you, Napolitano from Mortgage Brokers yeah, Ottawa. You yeah. said you're going to wait two years to get your house. OK, mm -hmm. now. I'm going to, this, there's going to be a story that's going to come out there sometime in the fall because I'm working on it right now, and it's going to be, uh, it's going to tell people why uh, young people can't afford to get a house. And I'm going to, and, and one of the major uh, um, impediments is what I'm going to be talking about. But that's for another subject. Mm -hmm. I want to mention about Mr. Trudeau's response to those poor, uh, uh, the, the young Aboriginal children whose bought, whose whose remains were found at that BC. Uh, Formal school, right? In Kamloops, BC. And I listened to his his uh, just a little bit on the sound bites yesterday, and uh, cause I, I I can't listen to his interviews anymore because he, he the man is he has no credibility in my mind. He never has for mm -hmm. me. The idea, his response was, you know, we're going to uh, as Canadians, we're going to pull together and we're going to do everything we can. At the same time, the opposition, uh, uh, Judd Nick Singh asked for an emergency meeting, and the opposition is asking. 
to do what should be done. Every 131 or 132 residential schools, let's look into all of them because these people need to have closure. I don't care how, how long those people had perished ago. They still need closure because if we're going to heal in this country, we have to start to go back to our past. We can't keep living it, but we have to right. get some kind of closure. And these people deserve it. And the money that this government's spending mm. and getting little, little value for it, some of that money can go to looking after these people and, 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 and their, their grief and, and their healing. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate uh, your input. I think it's really valuable. And you've, you, you know, you've touched on lots of different subjects, of course. And and I feel the same way. I'm always nervous about, you know, how is my daughter going to afford a house? And, and you talk about, you know, the way we're spending right now and how we're using those dollars. And I've often thought that, you know, coming out of this pandemic, we need to have sort of an inquiry. And I don't want it to cost, obviously, tons of money, but we need to know where all these dollars went. And did we get value? And I fear that maybe we didn't. And and you have the same fears, Roger. Well, uh, yes, and Mr. Mr. O'Toole, well, he touched on something too about those uh, those viruses that come out of that Winnipeg uh, uh, lab that were basically, I'm sure they were they were stolen by Chinese operatives. And this government seems to ignore everything about China. Now, if he wants, if he has such a, a fixation for China, why the hell doesn't he just take his dog and pony show and all his hangers on and get the hell into China where he belongs? That's the end of my. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. Uh, Roger, of course, sharing his thoughts from Drummond. We want to hear from you, of course. Uh, we're going to hear from Steve and Ron coming up as well. Um, we want to hear from you. 613-750-1310. We have two lines open right now. Uh, we definitely want to hear from you here on City News. Do you want to talk about taxes? Do you want to talk about vaccines? Do you want to talk about the 215 children that have lost their lives in Kamloops, BC. Are you wanting uh, a more more of an inquiry on this? Are you looking for those residential schools uh, that uh, that haven't had um, sort of that that investigation done around them in terms of their grounds to see if there are other burial sites? We fear, of course, that there are. I'm Sam Laprade, of course. This is the Rob Snow Show. I'm filling in for Rob. We're going to have lots of time to talk to you. Stay with us here on City News. news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. 
It's Tuesday, June 1st. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 20 degrees, and here's what's making news at this hour. City News has learned the provincial government is leaning toward not reopening schools for this school year. A final decision, though, by Cabinet still has not been made. Now, the latest COVID-19 numbers show amazing improvement, the lowest case number in months in our province. 699 new cases today, including 39 in Ottawa, two in Renfrew, but none in either Leeds, Grenville, Lanark, or the Eastern Ontario Health Unit. Now, 20,200 tests were done for these results with a positivity rate of 3.6%. The province also says nine more people have died from COVID in the last 24 hours. Fire crews on scene of that major blaze this morning on West Hunt Road. That's just around Carp Road, the fire in a large commercial building owned by Tomlinson. That company did tweet earlier this morning, all staff are safe, but they're asking people to avoid that area. Canada will have to wait to see if it advances to quarterfinals at the World Men's Hockey Championship. Finland rallied for a 3-2 shootout win over Canada today. Canada finishes and now has to wait for Germany and Latvia and hope that game doesn't go into a shootout in order to qualify for the quarterfinals. City News Time, 1031. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. The phone lines are definitely open here. 613-750-1310. Do you want to talk about what we've just heard? Potentially, this is just breaking news. Of course, multiple sources telling City News that the current recommendation Premier Ford and his cabinet will be looking at is to not reopen schools. This is not a final decision. We are following this story. You will not want to leave City News. We will keep you up to date all day long. Let's talk of vaccines. We're going to go to um, Steve in Lanark. How are you, Steve? Doing good, Sam. How are you? Good. Thanks for tuning in to City News. Great. Uh, I just want to interject something here. How come these injection places are not open 24-7 for people that are working shift work or whatever type thing, driving truck, you know, so they could get in and get their injection whenever they want to get it done? Why is it only from 9 to 5? You're not going to believe this, but I absolutely 100% have asked myself that question a thousand times. Have you? Yep, absolutely. I know they go till nine o'clock. So here in the Ottawa area, my mom yeah. got hers at like 8.57 uh, or something like that in the evening. But that was the last appointment of the day. But mm-hmm. I did feel that that was late. I have a lot of friends that work shift work. They're police yeah. officers or working 911, et cetera, or truck yeah. drivers, like you said. Dispatch, truck drivers, you name it. Nurses, yeah. you can do the whole, whole gamut, right? Yeah. So why not? you get your higher ups to contact uh, Bubba up there in Toronto, Doug Ford, and tell them to put that idea out to all these injection places. I'm open 24-7 so people can get injected if they want to get injected. I wish I had that kind of power, Steve. I, 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 yeah, I higher ups do, so get a hold of your higher ups. I'm going to get a hold of them. I'm going to get a hold of them and tell oh, them Steve and Lennon. one and get the number for Doug Ford up there and have a little chat with him and Absolutely. get him on the show. Well, I, I should. You know what? I'm gonna. We're gonna reach out to him and ask him about <laughs> that do. conversation. <laughs> and you'll my, know my that concern. they should be open 24/7, so people can get it whenever they want it, not from nine to five. And I know nurses got to go home and take right. a break, I think. Right. But it should be open 24 hours a day to keep everybody injected if they want to get injected. I haven't got it yet. It's been here for 15 months, and I haven't gotten no COVID, so I'm not gonna get it. Well, I certainly hope not. And I will say, though, Steve, and I think you have to agree with me, healthcare yep. workers in this province and in this country have stepped up big time. So we're, well, they you know, got the most dangerous job in the world. Absolutely, they do. The cops, so they got the yeah. most dangerous job in the world, yeah. dealing with people that might possibly have it. And, sure. uh, you know, it's pretty dangerous. For sure. So, you know, yeah. certainly know that they're working long hours and we appreciate everything they've done. Uh, have fun in the beautiful community of Lanark, my friend. I will. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Have a great day. We're going to head to where, you know, where I live, Haven. How are you, Ron? Yeah, hi, Sam. Um, Mr. O'Toole. Let's talk about him. I, I don't believe a word that comes out of his mouth. He's an oath breaker. He's a liar. He needs to go. He's. I don't think he's electable. I really don't. The, the, the man's... I, I, I don't know how to articulate it well enough to not just be cut off. 
So are you, right. no, let's talk about it. I think it's a really good point. I mean, I think anytime somebody puts their self in the, the political ring, right, people are, are going to think about how they're uh, going to connect with that person or not. Do you, do you feel that he's not an authentic leader? I don't think he's authentic. I think he's just uh, self-serving like uh, so many others and no different than Justin Trudeau in my book. He signed a pledge that he would end these carbon shenanigans. And what does he do? He comes out with an O'Toole Bucks plan. I mean, what is that? Uh, seriously. Right. How does that help anybody? Mm-hmm. Yeah, really. I, I'm sorry. It just it just drives me crazy that, that he, he just turns around like that when when the whole caucus when a majority of the caucus they just had said no do not mm-hmm. do this mm-hmm. no, I'm, I'm sorry and and one more thing you you brought up um, um yes i i agree that that the residential schools were horrendous it was it was evil yet these children do we know how they died no, we don't. But the, 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 the challenge that I think many people are having is on record, there was 51 children that had passed away there. Right. And right. Yeah, the, the grave has found 215. And you and I know that that math doesn't add up. That, no, it doesn't. Absolutely not. And, and yeah, I know in record keeping and, and, mm-hmm. and value of life was not the same back then, sure. but it's back then. And this could have been one bout of cholera or, or influenza or, or smallpox or, or typhoid. or. or I have to tell you, Ron, that, yeah, I, I have to tell you, I don't think that's the case. But, but thank you for your thoughts so much. Ron oh. calling from Barhaven. I'd love to go to Queen's Park right now. We know that question period's happening. Now bragging about the in-school testing and yet the Scott, the Toronto Star reveals quite clearly that the testing was woefully inadequate uh, and in fact Dr. Ashley Chute from the science table uh, calls the government's approach to testing scattershot uh, and says it was quote ultimately doing nothing in terms of our ability to take the data and make any sort of inference from it. In fact, the very best week of this government's testing in schools yielded 8,213 tests instead of the promised 50,000 tests that we've heard this minister brag about time and time again. So why did the government claim that their testing proved that schools were safe when they knew that that wasn't the case? And I'm sending the evidence over to the minister right now. Andrea Horvath, of course, leader of the uh, NDP party, asking uh, the premier about uh, a number of issues going on about schools. According to his independent analysis of transmission in schools is that they have been safe but the layers of protection put in place by the province of Ontario following the best medical advice has worked to reduce transmission when three to four schools in the height of the third wave had no active cases at all when 99% of students and 98% of staff had no case of COVID reported through the pandemic that demonstrates that the 1.6 billion dollars that the uh, layers of protection and that the strict public health interventions we put in place from september escalating them throughout the pandemic as the challenges change throughout ontario it demonstrates we were agile that we followed advice and we invested to keep kids safe and the authority is not the minister of education it's not the leader of the opposition it is the chief medical officer of health who has been consistent in Response? this province from september through the present that schools have been safe and we are grateful for the partnership to do that for the benefit of children in Ontario. Education Minister Stephen Lecce speaking about the decision to uh, potentially not open uh, schools. Of course, uh, we're also uh, playing a bit of a game today. Where's Waldo? Where's the Premier? Where's Doug Ford? Teachers, education workers, public health experts, speaker have all been clear what is needed in our schools, and that means smaller classes, fixing backlog repairs that the Liberals uh, left us with, vaccinations, and an actual testing strategy that is robust, which we haven't had. Instead, what we've had is education cuts in the last budget. Uh, The government, the Premier particularly, attacking our teachers and the government and this Premier claiming uh, that uh, that the experts were backing their plans when in fact they, they actually told him and he told, they told the minister and this uh, and the premier that they were literally flying blind. So, why did the government tell parents, schools, teachers, boards, everybody in this province that schools were completely sca- safe when, in fact, they knew that they had really no idea whether they were or they weren't? 
Andrea Horvath, of course, asking the tough questions today about schools. Every parent uh, in this province is looking to this conversation to find out if schools are going to reopen or not. We've heard, City News has heard from multiple sources that schools will not reopen. Back to Queen's Park. His best advice from September has kept students and staff safe. That is his repeated position on the record in, to the people of Ontario literally for the past year. So the question for the Leader of the Opposition is why do you not take the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of of health um, and why not accept the independent analysis he has made with the various tables that inform him that have built confidence for students and parents that our schools have been safe when 99 percent of students didn't have an active case 98 percent of staff when three out of four schools didn't have an active case at all at the peak of the third wave it underscores one truth that the investment we put in place has worked now with that said speaker there's 7,000 more staff that were hired this year 95 percent of schools had seen some upgrade to a ventilation we have 40,000 HEPA units and HEPA filters been improving air ventilation in schools, doubled the public health allocation, and yes, the only province in the nation with a targeted province-wide capacity to uh, c conduct asymptomatic testing. That is very important, and we are proud of the work we have done, mm -hmm. and we're going to continue to do everything we can for the benefit of students and for their safety in Ontario. Supplementary really clear that uh, investment was needed to keep kids uh, safe at school, but um, that's not, what, not what's happened in this province. The Premier heard it from teachers, from boards, from the science table, that they needed to invest in our kids, but they just didn't want to. And in fact, the FAO report uh, just the other day indicates very clearly that this government has cut $800 million from education just in this budget, and over the next decade, those cuts will increase significantly. Cuts to the classroom will not help keep our kids safe. They just won't. That's the reason why our schools aren't open today. So why is the Premier cutting education in this province? Why is the Premier doing that when it's clear to everyone that our kids need and deserve more investment what? now? They need it now more than ever before. Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the reason why schools were closed in the province, according to the Chief Medical Officer of Health, is because community transmission spiked to roughly 4,000 cases a day. That is the reason. And the member opposite knows it to be true. That's why we closed schools. That's why Nova Scotia announced closures in our regional bases. That's why BC did so in a targeted basis. We have to respond to risk profiles that change. When cases rise in the community, they're reflected in schools. We close them to protect families. We did that repeatedly. In the context of funding, we increased investment by $2 billion as we look forward to September, a $1.6 billion provincially funded increase in resources for COVID, a $500 million increase in the grant for student needs, and a targeted $85 million dollar support for summer learning and learning gaps. We've also quadrupled mental health funding. How can the member opposite suggest there's a reduction in expenditure? In the FAO report, when it comes to methodology, the FAO suggests uh, in the context of methodology that there is, that the, the Ministry of Education does not forecast based on compensation hikes. He makes assumptions on what those hikes may be. We do not. When it comes to the investment... Thank you. Thank you. The final supplementary. Okay, we want to hear from you. We're attack. hearing from Queen's Park, of course. Uh, some breaking news here. Multiple sources telling City News that the current recommendation Premier Ford is putting on the table with his cabinet will be looking at to not open schools. This has not been confirmed. We're obviously following this story very closely here at City News. Our team is working really hard to get you the most up-to-date numbers. Are you an exhausted parent? Are you a high school student? Are you in grade 12? I want to hear from you. Are you a grandparent? Are you a teacher? Are you concerned about the mental health of youth? We want to hear from you. 613-750-1310. Let's chat with you on City News. When you're, you've lost your breasts, you've sort of lost part of yourself. And then all at once, you're losing your hair. You don't know who you are anymore. You want to feel like yourself again. So I think that the store, a mastectomy store, is essential because you've lost your identity. 
And then all at once, you're looking for a wig, you need a headscarf, you need a camisole. There's nowhere to go. There's no one to talk to. This should be essential because there are more and more women that are getting breast cancer. I think that's one in six. They're becoming younger. I have a client that's 18 years old. And where do they go? They need a place like this that the women that work there understand. They know what you're going through. It's changed quite a bit. Our hours are different. We're now open and from 10 to 5 we're not as busy as we were a lot of women are afraid to go out uh, they're afraid that maybe there are more people in the store so that's why I try and let them know you are alone there's absolutely nobody in the store except you and I if there is a woman that she's very afraid I will lock the door to make sure nobody else comes in I'll put a sign back in 10 15 minutes just to give her that reassurance um, before we would have four five six people in the store we didn't have to turn anybody away now we do some clients do leave and they're upset because they're in the store they said you know we drove 20 minutes and now we're not allowed in the store and I try to make them understand Understand that there's somebody in here that's going through chemo or radiation so that's sort of changed a lot that we're not able to have more people in the store if we're talking about products there's the bras that are adapted for mastectomy uh, the bathing suits that are adapted to mastectomy we have special camisoles as well and uh, post-surgery bras and then we have for women going through chemo the wigs uh, that we have a big selection uh, in the store as well. We have scarves. Some women don't feel comfortable wearing a wig. They prefer to wear a scarf or a hat, so we have a huge uh, selection of that as well. We offer uh, compression garments as well. When you're going through a mastectomy, you might have lymphedema in your arms uh, after uh, a couple of years, and uh, you have flare-ups. So we have the sleeves, uh, the, the, the hand as well that can be covered. We show each other our scar. We talk about the treatments, how we felt, um, and I guess that's what they're looking for here. That, that's what makes us special. We have an added value in this store. Besides everything that's in the store, that's a product that's, that's, that can handle any problem that a client might have. Me and Linda, we've been through. We know how it feels in our bodies. On the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. Well, I've got to be honest, not a lot of things get me riled, but this school information we're hearing from uh, Queen's Park is getting me riled. I'm Sam LaPrade filling in for Rob Snow. We want to hear from you. We have heard that multiple sources are telling us here at City News that the current recommendation uh, Premier Ford and his cabinet will be looking at is to not reopen schools. Yes, parents, that's what I said, not reopen schools, to go right to the end of the school year with those children learning at home. Uh, however, Cabinet has not made a final decision on this matter. We are following this story very, very closely. You will want to stay here on City News for the breaking news. Exhausted parents, exhausted grandparents, exhausted teachers, exhausted students. There is no two ways about it. And I hear we have an exhausted grandparent, Armand. How well, How are you? Welcome to the show. Uh, I'm okay, but I'm not uh, Ford's friend. I'm not. So tell, no, me, not. tell me how you feel about this potential news today that schools will not reopen. What is wrong with this person? Like, he hears all the hospitals and doctors telling him that don't do it. Let him go back to school. He doesn't care if the kids have mental problems, whatever it is. He doesn't care. They need to be in classroom to reconnect with people. Mm -hmm. And that's what they have to do. But he doesn't see that. Even if we had just to say, go back for a few weeks and, you know, do the light stuff, but reconnect so they can say at the end of the year, oh, I did the year. That's it. I'm good. Right now, I feel the same way. I think this is, you know, I think I was, we all know there's a mental health crisis. There's no two ways about it. All you have to do is, is talk to Chio. They will tell you there's a mental health crisis with our youth right now. I was really hoping the kids were going to go back, as you know, or you may know, Armand, I've got a 13-year-old daughter. I'd yeah. love to see her, to your point, reconnect with her classmates, 
finish that year off those last three weeks um i i can't believe it to be honest with you we actually have two lines open i can't believe that every parent doesn't have a thought on this so please do call us any last uh, words armand from you well as far as i'm concerned it, no why did he have this letter go out you know why he had the letter go out so he can say can blame it on somebody else he didn't want to make a decision because he's now turning into a real coward and he always tells us, my friends, I've got your back. No, I think he's got a knife in my back. Sorry to say it. Well, certainly, and we're, you know, of course, we're always looking for him. We don't know where he is. He has certainly uh, been dodging question period as well. So it's really an interesting time. We're going to be following this story, Armand. Stay with us here on Thank City you. News. Uh, we're going to head to, um, to, uh, to Alec. How are you, Alec? Pretty good, yourself? Good. You wanted to talk about uh, schools, as we all do today. Yes, so my little brother is in grade 12 as we speak, um, and it's been pretty brutal. I mean, to come to think, over the last two years, uh, the fall of, of 2019, we had the teacher, teacher strike, which took off a good chunk of the kids' learning. It's a good point, for sure. And then we now we're in COVID, and really the amount of class time kids have had in the last two years is probably only one. It certainly hasn't been a lot of class time. It really has been uh, very challenging. I think we've lost uh, Alec uh, on the line, but it, you know, Alec brings up a really good point. Those those teacher strikes, of course, and then uh, to have COVID. I think about uh, lots of little kids. I have a very good friend of mine who's got a, uh, a boy in grade one and a boy in grade three, and I think you know those kids haven't had a lot of actual teacher time. Uh, we've got a couple of lines open: six one three seven five zero thirteen ten. Uh, do, are you happy? Are you someone that's actually happy that the kids aren't going back to school? I'll tell you that I'm not. Uh, but are you relieved as a parent? Do you Were you scared about kids going back to school? Are you a teacher? Are you willing to call us today? Are you a teacher in this system? Uh, how do you feel about this today? We'd love to hear from you, of course, as well. We're going to go, let's go downtown. We're going to talk to Cameron. How are you, Cameron? Hey, Sam. How's it going? Good. Thanks so much for calling. Uh, my pleasure. So I'm calling today because you asked a question about the teachers and the, the schools while well, the kids are going back to school or not going back to school. Right. And uh, I could say as a conservative, I am so annoyed. Mm -hmm. I'm so annoyed provincially and federally with the, the weak governing and uh, bouncing back and forth to, oh, yeah, 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 it's safe for kids. Oh, no, 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 it's no more safe now. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, mix the vaccines. Don't mix the vaccines. Take this one. Don't take this one. How about you all leave, figure it out, and don't come back until you did. As it far is as for our kids, yeah. as far as for our kids, um, it's, it's, in my view, probably the unions pushing the government <laughs> like crazy to not let it happen. Thought the same thing, Cameron, absolutely. And I think we are at a point in our history, in our lives, where we need to start asking ourselves the question, would the world be better without unions? Would things run better, faster, more efficiently without unions? And what do we do to replace unions? We need a better labor code. We no longer need unions. And I'll t uh, one more thing. I know there's other people waiting. Yes. Every time I go to pick up my, my child at school, when the school was open, I find that the air of entitlement and attitude that comes from teachers, it's so... Um, you're, you're, you're wondering, like, sorry, why am I getting attitude from you? Like... I don't know. I'm just so fed mm -hmm. up with teachers and them complaining that nothing is safe. And now the unions for mm -hmm. sure are pushing the government to not make it happen. Yeah. So when do we say enough is enough mm -hmm. and we demand that things change? Well, certainly today is going to uh, to really rock a lot of people. If the truth is uh, what we're hearing, of course, multiple sources telling us uh, that schools probably will not open, will not open. Uh, that has not been confirmed yet by the premier. Uh, we haven't had a final decision. Appreciate your time today, Cameron. Thanks for calling. Uh, let's go to Jamie in the beautiful town of Brockville. How are you, Jamie? I'm wonderful. How are you this morning? Good. You wanted to talk about schools. Yeah, there's there's a couple different ways you can look at it. Uh, obviously, he's doing the best that he can to make whatever decisions he can, but whether he put them back or didn't put them back, there's always going to be somebody that says, oh, he didn't make the right call or mm -hmm. whatever the case, right? 
back in February, he opened up everything early, and here we are still locked down again. So I can see him, you know, being a little bit anxious on pulling the trigger on that. For sure. And, and we know, you know, he certainly uh, has, has come down in the polls. <clears throat> He's got to obviously be thinking about that. There's lots of, uh, you know, lots going on in terms of the, the politics of this of this pandemic, of course, too. So I'm sure that that weighs on him, although many, many people really felt strongly about kids going back. We heard from from uh, the experts saying that it was important for kids mental health to be connected again. You know, my kid, uh, you know, does her schooling from her bedroom. That's not where I want her learning. I want her learning with other kids. Oh, I completely agree with you. I've got a, uh, a kid in senior kindergarten and a kid in grade one. And uh, like the other gentleman said there earlier, my poor guy in senior kindergarten really hasn't even been to school yet. Right. He got screwed last year because they, they, uh, they closed down early and then mm-hmm. they lost out on a bit this year because they got closed down early. Even the, the guy in grade one lost out because of the strike, like the other guy was saying. So. Right. The last three years really haven't even been proper schooling. Mm -hmm. Uh, Thank you so much, Jamie. Thanks so much for listening to us in Brockville here on City News. We have a teacher, Paul. I've been wanting to talk to a teacher. Tell me what your thoughts are, my friend. Get him back in school. Agree, 100%. We can. There's no doubt. That's every kid I talk to. I'm sure there's some outliers, but they want to get back in school as much as possible, Um, especially those grade 12, 12 students who are graduating. They're walking away from high school and... They didn't get a chance to do it. Um, just in our defense as teachers, you guys are mentioning uh, the kids missing out to the strike. Yeah, they missed four days. We walked for four days. It was only four days, guys. And I'll like to remind you guys, we were the primary two issues we were pushing for were, uh, one, no online learning. Um, the province was pushing online learning back then, so it's kind of ironic now that we were walking, trying to push, saying it's a bad idea, online learning. And the other thing was reduced class sizes. Um, so, yes, they missed four days. But, you know, like four days compared to how much time they missed in, in the lockdown, I wouldn't group those two things together. Mm-hmm. That, that. I will say, I think, I mean, I think there's a couple of different strikes we're talking about. There, there certainly was a lot longer than four days, um, I, don't know, I guess, different boards. But, um, but I, I mean, let me just say, Paul, I, this is, I have the utmost respect for teachers. And I think every single parent I'll just speak about myself in grade eight math for a second, um, got a different look at teachers when we were homeschooling kids. So this is no disrespect to teachers. I have the utmost respect for teachers. Absolutely. Yeah. The other thing is, um, you know, this whether, you know, how much time they lost in the, in the strike, if you want to try to equate that to how much time they lost in the pandemic, uh, have fun with that. But what I'm, regardless, they lost a lot of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and the current government brought in a regulation that says when you're in high school, um, schools will only fund students up to 32 credits. Um, and that's one thing I think, especially for this generation, we got to walk back on because uh, some kids are just getting credits, but are they getting a full education? Right. No. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's going to be a special lot of grade 12 students who, you know, their, their math their, their, or their science or their physics that they, they really need moving on to uh, study. You know, the quality just wasn't there. Agreed. And um, they should have the right to retake that credit if they need it. Absolutely. Um, really, really good point. Paul, I'm so grateful that you called today. Thanks so much for all your good work as a teacher. Uh, we're here on City News and we are going to be back. Stay with us.
local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Tuesday, June 1st. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 20 degrees. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. A decision apparently made but not released on schools. More on that in just a moment. But the latest COVID-19 numbers show the lowest new case count for months in our province. 699 new cases today. This includes 39 in Ottawa, 2 in Renfrew. Leeds, Grenville, Lanark and the Eastern Ontario Health Unit both reporting no new cases. Those results come from 20,200 tests completed in the province and a positivity rate of 3.6%. Now the province is also reporting nine more deaths related to COVID. Cabinet still hasn't given final approval, but it appears a decision has been made on whether children will be back to in-class learning before the end of this month, the end of the school year. We get more from Alex Bloomfield. The reopening rumor mill is swirling. Multiple sources telling our Richard Southern, the Premier and his Cabinet will be looking at a recommendation tomorrow that would see in-person learning remain closed. A final decision has not yet been reached and the Toronto Star reports the Premier favours that recommendation because it may allow the first step of reopening to be moved up. Opening schools would force it to, to wait until at least June 14th, perhaps later. So no announcement on all of this expected today, but with the state at home order expected to expire at midnight. Uh, it certainly seems that we'll get some major announcements at a Queen's Park uh, before the end of the week. From Alex Bloomfield. City News Time, 11.02, and now the forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. For Ottawa, the Valley and Smith Falls today, we'll get into some clearing. Generally sun and cloud today, the high 26 degrees. Tonight, mainly clear in 12. And tomorrow, sunshine, rain moves in overnight Wednesday for Thursday morning. And the high tomorrow, 27. For today, the high, 26. And right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, it's 20 degrees. Canada's expert advisory panel on vaccines updating its guidance on mixing and matching. It's expected they will approve the provinces giving you a different shot for your second dose where necessary. Here's City News Parliament Hill reporter Cormac McSweeney. For weeks, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization has been pouring over a study out of Spain and early daddy from a UK study that show mixing different vaccines for your first and second dose can be safe and effective. Federal officials have hinted that's the route we may take and at a news conference later today, reports say NACI will be giving that, that official advice to the provinces. Until now, provinces have been telling people to use the same vaccine for the first and second dose, leading to some concern for those that received the AstraZeneca shot after provinces halted first doses and left the second in doubt due to supply and blood clot concerns. Conservative health critic Michelle Ramble-Garner is not pleased with the guidance that keeps changing. The federal government's got to get their act together on this. I, I, it concerns me that the narrative changes every week. Provinces can make their own decisions and are not bound by NACI's advice, but Manitoba didn't wait and has already approved the mixing of vaccines. Cormac McSwinney, Parliament Hill. Indigenous leaders are demanding more than speeches today. The so-called take note debate gets underway in Parliament. That's basically giving MPs a chance to give their point of view before the government releases its decision. The focus on the recent discovery of remains of more than 200 children on the grounds of former Indian residential school in Kamloops. BC. Fire crews remain on scene of a blaze this morning on West Hunt, Cl uh, West Hunt Road. That's just north of Richardson Side Road. That fire was in a large Tomlinson commercial building now. Firefighters did arrive to find the facility fully engulfed. West Hunt is closed at CARP. The 417 westbound ramp to CARP Road is also closed. You can expect delays in that area. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. The world is changing. So keep up with Rob. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. I'm Sam Laprade filling in for Rob Snow. We know uh, here on City News we have been following the story very closely. The absolutely horrific discovery of the remains of 215 children in Kamloops, B.C. at a, at a residential school. Uh, this uh, is devastating for this country, devastating for the Indigenous community. We wanted to speak with Annie Smith St. George, an Algonquin elder from the Kitigan Zibi Reserve. How are you, Annie? 
Good morning. Annie, I'm fine. I, I have thought uh, about uh, this in the last number of days, and, and I feel in many ways I don't have words. I, I actually... I want to say I'm sorry. I want to. I want to. You know, let you know that you know, my, on behalf of Canadians, on behalf of of myself, how absolutely horrific this has been. This discovery, and we're thinking about all of you. Yes, it's. Um, it falls under the um, the uh, month of uh, the history month of uh, the Indigenous people in month of June. Eh? Mm-hmm. I. Uh, uh, greetings, first of all. You, I welcome you all on the Algonquin Territory. Thank you. And um, I lit a smudge in memory this morning for um, the opening of the Solstice Festival and um, in memory of all the ones that uh, passed on. And today is, a, is a, also a day where I'm in a... I'm, I lost my son at the age of 16 through suicide. Oh, Annie, I'm so sorry. And today is June 1st. He would have been 48 years old. He was my eldest son. And that, again, is a a generational impact of results of residential schools, the Indian Day schools that they had on reserves, the federal Indian Day schools, and the provincial schools and how we were treated back in the day. Well, I'll say mum to mum, I can't even imagine losing a child and, and... and to suicide. I, I'm really, really sorry to hear that. Uh, I could understand and feel what has happened. You know, this started in the 1800s, mm-hmm. the residential schools. And um, our children, the children back then, and the children too, were uh, removed, stolen from their, their communities literally stolen, and kidnapped, and uh, were brought away, far away from their parents. And um, just imagine your child be taken from you. I can't, Annie, to be honest with you, and I think that's that's what's really resonating with Canadians. And I think it's resonating that, to your point, you know, starting in the in the 1700s and then, of course, continuing and knowing that there was still uh, many residential schools still operating in the 1990s, which really is just a stone's throw away. And uh, this past weekend, I had the pleasure of speaking to a number of representatives about the Summer Solstice Indigenous Festival and really enjoyed learning about uh, about the festival and very much on. Uh, I think it was the morning of sort of hearing the show that we had done, uh, we heard this incredible sad news coming out of mm-hmm. Kamloops. And and to your point, too, I often thought about, you know, this is the month um, that we really do think about uh, about our Indigenous cultures and, and Indigenous peoples. So mm-hmm. there was a smudging this morning, Annie. Walk me through what that was like. Well, the smudging process, it, it had to be done through virtual today because of the covid but the smudging, usually we do smudging ceremonies at site, on site, and people come and to cleanse themselves and to be able to to stand stronger. And when you smell the sage or and all the mixed medicines, it gives you an inner strength to pass on another day, especially with this news. You know, when we look back in our history, you know, these stories were told, okay, and and when it was the uh, when they did the apology and the TRC, you know, with the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation, right. and the stories in in the Truth and Reconciliation, every everybody spoke about this that there were graveyards by schools, and um, it was story told. Now, story is a reality. 215 children found. And I think the the scary part, I think, for, for many people is we know the number's higher. And it really is now how do we actually... Uh, discover the real number because we know that uh, there potentially is thousands of children in this situation. That there, there, there is many. There were many graves, the unknown graves, the uh, what they call no mark, not mark graves, mm-hmm. besides the residential schools. Yes, and um, there is going to be more. I'm sure. 
What would you hope? What would you hope the the government does at this point, Annie? Are you looking for each one of those residential schools to have this type of uh, of inquiry, to have this type of uh, discovery, um, and, and at least look at those schools to see if there's the same situation that's happened in Kamloops? Yeah, they're going to be. They're going to find some more, I'm sure, because there was um, apparently a request for 75 more. Now, I don't know if it's from Count Loops. I'm not sure exactly. Mm-hmm. It's not out. But anyways, they were calling for 74 little shoes to come. And there's children in there that were of the age of four, maybe three or four years old, that they found. And it's a dark history. It's, a, it's, a, it's our darkest history in Canada that we lived, you know, and um, what I would like to see is um, not only saying the word reconciliation, but really to all, I would wish that all Canadians come together and to to work with us, work with us, mm-hmm. and to have a have better understanding of our history. Because these dark moments, this was not only the first genocide. We also were given the, uh, we were given the, we, I think we were one of the people that were hit with the nuclear, the uh, biological warfare with the uh, poison blankets of the smallpox mm-hmm. at the beginning of time and around that time. And so we, we have, we're a nation, so nation, nations were suffered we suffered a lot and i think if we look back in our history i think the history books will have to be written and have to be addressed truthfully i think the truth has coming out is coming out now and uh, when you say truth and reconciliation i think the truth is this mm-hmm. is the whole finding of these remains and um, my heart goes out quite as much in ceremony this morning because my heart went, goes out to the, the ones that are still that are still here and are surviving, are, are on a survival mode and going back into that, that space again where this discovery, you know, discovery of the remains opened, you know, and mm-hmm. still more to come probably. And... Um, when I was doing the closing of the Truth and Reconciliation, there was people there, so many that were hurting. And this hurt will submerge again, this hurt will come back. And uh, I think at this moment of time is let the people, to, the ones who are hurting, mm-hmm. let them to express their hurt in many ways. But in reality, I would like to have the remaining com- the Canadian community, the Canadian people, and uh, the Francophone people to come and to join us and to help us get through this, this probably these hardest times and darkest times of history in our life. As I well. don't know if you feel it, Annie, but I, I really feel from everything that I've uh, seen in the last number of days and, and connected with my friends and our listeners here at City News, I really do feel like like Canadians are really embracing uh, all of you right now and, and thinking of you and grieving with you. Um, and, and I really, you know, I hope you feel that, that, uh, you know, we also are um, are thinking and, and wanting action. It's one thing to, to lower flags. It's another thing to take action. And I'm hoping uh, that we see some action from this. Yeah, time. we take actions towards institutions, schools. Mm-hmm. Okay, still, there's some schools that still remain the same. Okay, not in a, not in the same way, but in a different way. Um, and. Uh, I think the school should be more open. Institutions should be more open to listening to our history, because uh, our history is a long way. Our our people were very welcoming people at the beginning of time. We uh, we quoted the people that arrived here. We helped the sick. We uh, sheltered them. Mm-hmm. We. Uh, we we did everything because our country is very cold, and so we greeted them in a good way. 
and yet this happens to us now yeah. and um I would like to see in the future that the original people of the land is recognized first, mm-hmm. first and foremost, that we were here first. And then, you know, the English or the French that came in. Mm-hmm. Be. But uh, this, is, this is only what I wish to see. I wish to see also that there will be more presence in the, um, in the nation's capital of of all the wrongdoings that that had happened, uh, for instance, um, maybe correct corrective measures with uh, Johnny McDonald, for one, the right. statue, and yep. and all the all what we see like mm-hmm. around us, and to maybe come together and think what we're going to do about the statue of Johnny McDonald. And there's certainly there's no two ways about it, Annie. There is lots of work to do, and I I really value your time today, and I I look forward to future conversations with you. And I know the Summer Solstice Indigenous Festival is a really important piece. I encourage oh, yes. all of our listeners to get involved, Annie. I really oh, appreciate your time today. Yes, and I think I would invite everybody to to come in and to. Unfortunately, we can't meet mm-hmm. in person again with COVID. But uh, to come in and to listen and to enjoy, enjoy our ceremonies, our celebrations. We're still going on with it. And um, to if you, they need a smudge or if we're on site and they need so much, just to come in and be a part. Thank I would you. like to have a, more of um, a, a working together, working in harmony together. Mm-hmm. We're all on this. We're all in this together. Absolutely, Annie. Thank you so much for your time. Annie Smith, St. George, is, of course, an Algonquin elder. I appreciate your time today. Okay, Annie. Thank you very much for giving me the time to speak. I have a lot more to say. (laughs) We'll we'll talk another day, I promise, Annie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miigwech. Thank you. And Annie, of course, was referencing the hurt and the grief. We're going to talk about that hurt and grief when we come back here on City News. Part of the reason I got back back into this is because um, I am creative and I also wanted to kind of have a fun flair, 50s vibe. All of the boxes are kind of fun names. The colors are fun. The logo is fun. And it, it's not just the package that I want to bring joy to people's lives. It's also the feeling that they get when they receive it to know that there's someone that thinks of them and they're missing them and showing that they care when they can't be there. The smallest of the subscription boxes is the red box, the classical box. So you would get five to seven items from the variety of categories. Those do change quarterly. However, with items that are more popular, we'll bring them back as people ask for them or you could get them as an add-on option. And then those items will be included in the jazzy box, the same items from the first, although they'll be in a larger size, more quantity, as well as a couple extra items. And then in the largest box, the Duop Deluxe, which is our most popular, that is a comprehensive offering of all of the other two boxes plus additional. So for example, if you were to get a certain item in the smallest of the boxes, that item would still be offered in the large, but in a, in a bigger size. So you're getting everything bigger plus an extra few items. The first thing is I look for Canadian suppliers and manufacturers. That is something I'm very proud of. I make sure that the products are safe, um, that they fit into the packages that we offer, obviously. They have to be the proper size and weight. Um, I have approximately 300 items that we have so far that we can order that basically help um, make people's lives easier. There's snacks, there's self-care items, there's entertainment, a little bit of everything. And basically I try it and test it and if it's duly approved, then I include it in our packages. So some of the categories that we have is we offer treats, which is of course everyone likes treats no matter how old you are. So we have things like nuts, uh, chocolates, different types of snacks, maybe a handmade piece of jewelry. We also include pieces of jewelry as well, occasionally. Uh, We also have our pamper items. So your pamper items would include things like your bath soaks, 
your uh, specialty uh, lotions, things like that. Two other categories we offer are leisure. Leisure would include things such as puzzles, adult coloring books, paint by numbers, crosswords, word find, Sudoku, if that's how you say it. Um, and we also have items for self-care and health. So masks, sanitizers, sanitizing wipes, they're all natural, non-drying, made with natural ingredients. So they're very, um, they're very good for everyone, especially in this time. Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Thank you so much for joining us here on City News. I'm Sam LaPrad filling in for Rob Snow. We are watching any breaking news coming out of Queen's Park regarding, of course, uh, whether schools are going to open or not. Multiple sources have told us they will not be opening. We have talked a lot about the 215 children, their remains found in Kamloops, B.C. at a residential school. We've heard uh, just a minute ago from an Algonquin elder about the grief and the hurt. And we wanted to speak to Elaine Dean, bereaved families of Ontario and the Ottawa region, about grief. Welcome to the show, Elaine. Thank you very much for having me, Sam. Elaine, you and I have spoke about a grief before. It is, uh, it is something that I think uh, has many, many stages to it. Nobody's journey is the same. Let's talk about these families, uh, their loved ones, the, the grief that they're experiencing right now. Um, what were your initial thoughts when you heard the story? This story is um, its such a tragedy, and it's a tragedy for those children that didn't get to live their lives and grow up and be part of their families and their communities. And it's a tragedy, of course, for their families. And it's a tragedy, too, for Canada and our history. And our, as Canadians, we are grieving for this moment and what has happened and what has come to light. Mm -hmm. And of course, the grieving process is, is so different. I think if you, you know, you sort of expect, obviously, to grieve over a loved one that you, um, you know, maybe uh, watch them be ill for a long time and then pass away. That's a, that's a kind of grief. This kind of grief, um, sort of a country in grieving, if you will, is a different kind of grief. But I don't think it should be um, diminished in any way. I think in, in, in a way that uh, by grieving as a country, I'm hoping that that helps the healing. I hope so too. Um, grief is something, as you said, that it is per deeply personal to each one of us. And yet, when we're grieving, oftentimes people show up for a moment and they help us. But our grief, we own it and we're on our own for the most part. Mm -hmm. At bereaved families, we've all experienced loss. And we've been supported ourselves, and we support other people through peer support. And, and our purpose is to um, support them, share each other's stories, and help people to heal and grieve in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. um, and then at this moment, it is a society that's grieving, not an individual. And it's something that uh, we need to reflect on, how this happened. And we also need to come together in hope and in healing as well. Um, and we need to reflect on and remember the people that were lost. Mm -hmm. I remember when I lost my father in 2016 and, you know, looking at grief uh, on the Internet and looking at the stages of grief. And I remember seeing, you know, those five little steps of grief, you know, the mm -hmm. the anger and, and, you know, the despair, of course, and then the acceptance. And I remember thinking, mine doesn't look like this. Mine looks like a Jackson Pollock painting. <laughs> And I said that to somebody and they went, oh my gosh, that's exactly what my grief looked like. There's something about coming together to talk about grief, isn't there? Absolutely. Um, it, it, that's a really good uh, analogy that you shared because it isn't uh, a, a trajectory. You take a step forward and then uh, you can find yourself, uh, for me, my loss was seven years ago and I can find myself right back in the depths of my grief. Um, it's something that we experience that actually, for me anyway, I can speak to and, and probably for you too, Sam, it's life altering and life changing. There's always going to be for me a before and after. 
Um, and I made it through that experience with the help of many other people around me, which I'm really grateful for. It's such um, and that's important. what we want for other people, too, that they have support when they need it. Really, really important, of course, you know, reflecting on the 215 um, children. But let's be honest, too, there's been 25,000 people in this country um, pass away uh, and uh, because of COVID, um, you know, and in this region, obviously, uh, many people as well. So um, that grief, I think, during COVID has been uh, very complicated because we haven't been able to gather like we normally would uh, in, a, in a setting and, and sort of feel that closure. For sure. Um, During the 15 months that we've been all experiencing COVID, we've been in social isolation for lots of it. Um, People who have lost loved ones during this time um, find that they're more alone and it's more of an effort to be part of the community and for people to reach out and support them. So for us, all our programs are now virtual. Um, and uh, so we do uh, a monthly support and share night. We do a weekly support and share afternoon where people come now by peer support. And this Sunday, we're having our butterfly memorial event. It's actually our 10th annual butterfly event where people come together, not just who have had a recent loss, but people who have experienced the loss but want to come together in love and remembrance. And so we listen to a guest speaker and we release butterflies in memory of our loved ones. If it was in person, we'd get the opportunity to release the butterflies ourselves in the garden, but uh, this event is going to be um, broadcast over YouTube so that people can watch it and be part of it. Um, So we come together to share that feeling. And the other part about this is everybody is welcome. It's, uh, It's a spiritual community event. It's not about religion. Everybody, regardless of age, gender, sex, culture, financial status, physical ability, all come together. Amazing. To remember our loved ones. Amazing. Elaine Dean, I always appreciate your time. Bereaved Families of Ontario, Ottawa Region. You can definitely find out information about that event happening on Sunday. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation regarding the 215 children in Kamloops. Stay with us here on City News. in Ottawa and the Valley. This 
is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Tuesday, the 1st of June. Good morning, I'm Sarah Buck, and right now in Ottawa, we've got partly cloudy skies and 21 degrees. It's partly cloudy and 21 in Smith Falls. Here's what's making news this hour. No final decision until tomorrow, but City News sources at Queen's Park say Premier Doug Ford is leaning toward keeping the schools closed to in-person learning. The Toronto Star is reporting that direction may be powered in part by a desire to move up the reopening plan for the province, which has a step one currently set for the week of June 14th. Ontario's stay-at-home order expires at midnight. Stay with City News for more on this developing story. Provincial health officials report 39 new cases of COVID-19 in Ottawa out of 699 new cases across Ontario. There were nine new deaths in Ontario due to the virus. Elsewhere locally, Leeds Grenville Lanark Health Unit confirms no new cases. Public Health Ontario is reporting no new cases in eastern Ontario and two new cases in Renfrew County. The local health units update their numbers in the afternoon. Charlottetown City staff have permanently removed a statue of Sir John A. Macdonald from a downtown intersection in response to recent revelations about the country's residential school system. A vigil was held yesterday where demonstrators placed 215 pairs of shoes next to the Macdonald statue following last week's tragic discovery of the remains of 215 children buried at a former residential school in Kamloops, B.C. Mi'kmaq chiefs are pleased that Charlottetown City Council has decided to remove the statue, calling the move long overdue. I'm Sarah Buckin. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's a pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Thank you so much for joining us here on City News. Make no mistake about it, we are watching the news very closely at Queen's Park to find out if we're getting an actual decision from the Premier regarding schools. We understand from multiple sources the schools will not be reopening, uh, but we have not had that confirmed. But, of course, uh, Mark Day and Sarah Buchan will be bringing you the uh, news all afternoon. They will make sure you receive it as quickly as possible. We wanted to speak with Saul Mamakwa. Hello, Saul. Hi there. Hi. How are you? Good. Of course, NDP, MPP for Kinnanitwick Nog. I'm going to actually, I'm going to ask you to say it because I feel like I'm not saying it correctly. It's a Kiwetnung, which is which means north. Kiwetnung. Thank you so much. I promise to work on that. Uh, I really wanted to spend time with you today to talk about the tragic discovery of 215 children, their remains in Kamloops, B.C. It seems unfathomable that that sentence is even coming out of my mouth, but we know, sadly, there is probably more children. What are you hoping the government of Ontario is going to do, Saul? Yes, I know. Uh, obviously, uh, again, uh, thank you for acknowledging that. That uh, you know, we are um, united in grief as Indigenous people, but also we should be as Canadians. And I think uh, yesterday I called on the on the Ontario and the Canadian government to work with First Nations uh, at the sites of the schools and look for our lost children. And this process, uh, this uh, search, should be. First Nations led, and I think uh, we have to understand. You know, it is one of these uh, uh, great open secrets that our children lie on these properties of former schools, and uh, an open secret that Canadians can no longer, uh, you know, look away from it. So that's one of the things I, uh, you know, uh, that we need to look into, you know, in the coming weeks, in the coming months. It is absolutely tragic. I think, uh, like you said, all Canadians are grieving, but the Indigenous community, um, this, as you said, this was uh, a well-known secret, if you will. What are you hoping the government will do and how quickly are you wanting them to act? I think uh, one of the things I'm asking the province of Ontario is I know uh, to have a uh, um, you know, a day of mourning and remembrance and uh, of the 215 that were found. And uh, so I'm working with them right now on it. And um, and, and I mean, that's just uh, one piece, right? Like, but I think it's really important. Uh, what, had ha- what has happened as well here is uh, it certainly has opened up a lot of uh, old wounds, uh, you know, of Indigenous people. We are hurt. Uh, we are in mourning. And I think uh, there needs to be some type of healing initiative that needs to happen immediately because, you know, our, our people are hurting. It's, um, you know, uh, 
and, that, and that's very clear. And I think one of the other things is, uh, you know, again, uh, to provide funds for, you know, uh, to have a funding timelines planned for this governance search of the grounds of former residential schools. And, you know, mm-hmm. again, we need to have a plan and make sure that this is uh, First Nation led and business led. And uh, we need to be able to do that so we can uh, uh, provide justice for the survivors and their families today. And, um, and I think uh, what's important as well, uh, you know, uh, Canada and on, the provinces should demand apologies from those who have helped commit these crimes, heinous crimes. You know, uh, Pope Francis, the Catholic Church, and all other churches that have been involved must own up to their part of this genocide. You know, and it's really important. I think it's a really good point. That apology... Uh, would certainly, um, you know, be be from, obviously, hopefully the Pope. If 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 it was going to go to that to that degree, is this something that you feel will impact uh, the Indigenous community, or do you think they'll they'll just think this is just, you know, obviously just speaking to them as opposed to being really authentic? I think we need uh, something that's uh, very genuine. We need something that's authentic, and I think that's what we need to. Uh, they need to. The churches need to acknowledge. The Pope needs to acknowledge that they were part of that. Uh, um, you know, uh, that they, they were part of these. You know, the heinous, heinous crimes that uh, have happened. And you know, we. You know, I. Uh, um, I've been speaking about. You know how. You know this is. Um, you know uh, um, when we talk about. Um, you know, you know the tools of genocide that are there, and uh, not only that. Uh, you know, uh, it's a really, um, you know, crimes against humanity. Mm-hmm. And you know, if if it happened to uh, you know non First Nations, uh, perhaps white people, you know, it would be it would be different. For and, sure. Uh, we'll, yeah. Absolutely, and I think I look back on the you know I I, I just actually. Um, reviewed the 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 tr- truth and reconciliation uh report last night really took some um some time to look at that and i think back to a number of the different points in there and i can tell you right now i mean i obviously uh, went to school here in ontario not one word in our history books speaks about any of this is that part of it teaching our youth uh you know uh when we talk about uh, this government this uh uh, PC government that's in power in the province here, and you know my colleagues that sit across the way. I mean, that's the first one of the first things that they did when they came into power. They canceled these uh, indigenous curriculum writing uh, sessions, and you know right away there was no history. Like uh, and then right away, and I think that's one of the things that happened. And uh, you know, um, you know, um, and they have to own up to those, and that's. So they're the government that we're dealing with and that's the government that we're trying to be able to you know acknowledge that and you know to take away to, uh, for the sake of uh, saving uh, a few uh, hundreds of thousand dollars or millions of dollars uh, at the expense of you know not teaching the real history the real mm-hmm. Canadian colonial history of Canada you know you'd rather save money over, you know, telling the truth of what mm-hmm. the truth is happening in the, in the country, in this, in this province. Because I think we can agree, I mean, certainly at my school, there wasn't a graveyard, right? I think there's, there's this is something that is just so heinous. Uh, we know that they had recorded the deaths of 51 children, when in truth, there was 215, and once again, only one school. Uh, I, I think when we look back at this, uh, unfortunately, in a decade from now, we'll look back and think this was the first 215 children. Do you think the same? I think there will be more. Like I mean, like uh, you talk about uh, the school that you went to, you had playgrounds, and then when we have uh, uh, Indian residential schools, we have graveyards. You know, like I think that's a very stark reality of what. You know the system uh, of oppression, the system of uh, colonialism, the system of uh, you know genocide that's in place, and uh, and, and I think uh, we need to. I think I believe we believe as First Nations, as Indigenous people, that there are more you know of our children out there. Mm-hmm. And, we know uh, it. And, uh, you know, 
We know at Queen's Park as well, Saul, that when, um, you know, the, the word was coming out, a number of people tried to place little shoes at Queen's Park to represent the 215 children. They were turned away um, from security. They were told they couldn't do that. Was that another part of the hurt and the grief? And um, so that's the, uh, uh, that's part of it. That's, uh, you know, like the system that's there. Uh, the as indigenous people like the system that uh, whether it's uh, security whether it's the uh, that you know uh, the system uh, of governance and the bureaucracies and the systems that, of government that are there like these were never created for indigenous people um, these systems uh, the system here I'm in is is a, is a colonial system and I live it every day I see it every day and uh, you know uh, uh, when uh, when I had to, like for example, like I did uh, a moment of silence yesterday. I did a, uh, um, you know, like I did my, uh, I, I spoke for about 10 minutes on that issue with the moment of silence, but I had to get an okay from the government side to say, you know what, okay, he can do it. So, you know, that's all part of it. That's all part of the uh, the colonial uh, machinery of government that's in place. And, you know, and like, again, that those shoes that were trying to be put there on Saturday night and is part of it. Let's talk about what you would love every Canadian, every Ontarian to do in wake of this tragic news. What what action do you want us to take? Like I said before, it's one thing to lower flags. It's another thing to, you know, to do it. But, but what action do you want us to take? Where do you want to, uh, to see this end in terms of, of uh, not even end, but where do you want to see the learning begin in many cases? I think it's very important uh, to, you know, like uh, these gestures are important, uh, you know, to stand in solidarity with what's happening, the morning that's happening across the country with indigenous people. I think it's it's important to share these stories, uh, whether it's through social media. But I think more importantly, like we kind of have, uh, you know, whether it's your MPs or MPPs, you know, to be accountable and uh, to make sure they move forward and following the um, the 94 calls to action, um, the TRC 94 calls to action. So very important, like example is, uh, you know, like I think the change will be, you know, making sure this, uh, you know, the government that's in, uh, you know, uh, in power to uh, uh, reinvest and reinvest into the, uh, uh, the indigenous curriculum writing uh, that they pulled back back in 2018. And I think uh, that's, uh, you know, that's where the change lies is within our children, within our mm-hmm. youth, because I know that, you know, like it's going to take time, but it's got to start somewhere. Like we cannot see these things immediately change because, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, the colonialism has been in operation for hundreds of years. And um, mm-hmm. and so I think if we start the process uh, of educating our children, our youth and uh, the students that are young, they are the change. And we need to be able to do that. And uh, and I think, uh, you know, in getting uh, supporting First Nations and to, uh, you know, leading that search for uh, other school sites, uh, residential school sites, is very important. And I think that that's so very important. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, you mentioned too that you would like to see it indigenous-led. What does that look like? You know, uh, uh, you know, um, whether uh, you know, I, I always talk about colonialism, oppression, and how. Uh, indigenous people do not trust, uh, you know, governments at any level, whether it's uh, the province, whether it's uh, uh, the federal level. Like they say the good things, they'll say the right things, but the actions are not are very limited on, on actually what they do. And uh, and I think that's really important. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, um, you know we need these processes in our own way uh, to be able to lead these. And uh, you know, like. Uh, we select the people that we want to work with. We select the people that will actually do the work. We select the people that will do the the reporting. And we, you know, like, and I think that's really important. And uh, you know, uh, and I think, uh, but it's important that uh, uh, you know that you know they are the head of the table, not not the not the feds, not the provinces uh, leading that process. And that's what I mean by it's got to be led by business groups and business First Nations themselves and whatever search that they're doing uh, across Canada or uh, across Ontario. Thank you so much. And I I just want to say from a personal perspective that I'm so sorry that um, that your community, the Indigenous community and Canadians are are all thinking about you. Yeah, thank you for those uh, kind words. It it means a lot. 
NDP MPP for Kinnawagane. I really appreciate your time. Saul Mamakway, thank you so much for joining us. When we come back, we're going to speak with David Gorley from the Shepherds of Good Hope. Stay with us here on City News. Papa Jack was started uh, uh, 14 years ago, really by accident, more than anything. Uh, a friend of mine had bought a grocery store, a popcorn machine was in there, he didn't want it, I ended up by buying it. My family thought I was nuts. When I first said, come and pick up this popcorn machine, uh, my son said, what the heck for? Uh, I won't use the exact words. But anyway, uh, we started and it just kept on growing and growing. Um, but at the time, I was the only one selling popcorn in Ottawa. But we persever persevered as a family, and here we are. So it's, it's been very, very rewarding uh, for my family and myself. And to see our brand name, Papa Jack, and Papa Jack came out of, I wanted something that was going to be very bilingual. So Pepe, and then in Ontario, everybody called me Jack, even though my name is Jacques. In, Ke in Quebec, it's fine, it's Jacques, but in Ontario, it was always Jack. So we married the two together, Papa, Jack. With the store that we have on Thurston Drive, um, it basically, the factory's in the back. If you come in to the store, you can see how the popcorn is being made during the week. So it adds an, an extra uh, layer of, you can see the sanitation, you can see how we do it. Um, it's not like making popcorn. Most people thought when I started this, I was making popcorn in my garage or in my basement. Uh, no, never did. Uh, it was started in this building, in the back of the building, and then we kept growing and growing until what we have now. My daughter and my son came up with a brilliant idea to do a fundraiser online. So basically all people have to do is to register here and we give them a special code number. And with that code number, they tell their friends, or their neighbors, everybody to buy online from us with that code number. And then at the end of each period, could be two weeks, could be a month, then we'll pay them a 20% of all the businesses that we got through that code number. One thing I'd like to say is thank you to all the Ottawa people who have supported us and support local businesses. It, um, sometimes people, you know, they, uh, they talk about buying um, locally. Um, now it becomes that much more um, important to buy locally to support your local businesses because not too many of them are going to survive this. We're fortunate that we're so far so good. Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Sam LaPrade filling in for Rob Snow here on Rogers TV and City News. We know that it is June 1st today, so happy Pride, everybody. It's uh, uh, an exciting month ahead. We look forward to chatting with a number of different guests on this topic as we move forward in the month. But right now, we're going to shift gears a little bit and speak with David Gorley. How are you, David? I'm great, Sam. How are you? I'm good. And I we're going to talk about singing, but you're going to promise me you're not going to ask me to <laughs> sing, right? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me to sing. Thank God. <laughs> you'd, 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 lose, you'd lose your thousands and thousands of uh, followers and listeners. Well, David, you're the director of philanthropy for the Shepherds of Good Hope. And one thing I know about the Shepherds of Good Hope, you are very creative. You're wanting to engage the community. Talk to me a little bit about Sing for Hope. Well, Sing for Hope, Sam, is is our innovation and in reimagining uh, philanthropy in our community. I mean, I, I don't need to tell you and your your audience that everything has been fundamentally disrupted, and fundraising is no exception. And instead of using COVID as an excuse to fundraise, what we want to do is is tackle it head on. And and the new normal that people are experiencing right now 
So Sing for Hope is a is an experience based fundraising activation. It allows us to go into people's homes through um, virtual presentation and partner with uh, an industry that has also been deeply affected by the pandemic, and that's our local musicians. Sam, there is incredible talent in our community from from household names to uh, names that may not be as well known, um, whether they be vocalists, guitar players, percussion, organ, piano, you name it. Um, the, the depth of, of talent in this community that we're bringing together uh, on June 17th is, is just inspiring. And we, we want to turn that into an opportunity not only to promote the musicians, of course, and local business, because a lot of these musicians are they're running their own businesses. They're mm-hmm. self-employed. Um, but we also want to raise money for our programs. We've had a very difficult winter at Shepherds, and that's across the, the entire um, sector, the homelessness sector, social services sector. We, we, we had lockdowns and uh, outbreaks and, and restrictions. Um, you know, and I think the one thing that really uh, affected me personally and our team in the foundation and across the organization is is the, the, the impact on the morale for our frontline workers um, and also the fact that our clients those who are coming to Shepherds uh, for food service uh, three three times a day, uh, when we had uh, a lockdown and outbreak, you know, having to serve through the door, and uh, those who want to enjoy a nice warm meal having to eat outside in the winter. When the premier announced a stay-at-home order, um, it's easy for you and I, Sam. We 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 have a home. Not everyone has a home. And so it's been a very difficult winter, and we want to tell that story. So we we thought, what better way than through the universal language of music? It is fantastic, and I understand you have a hometown favorite in Kathleen Edwards. We do absolutely. We've Kathleen, uh, you know, is, has been so wonderful to work with. Uh, she recorded a brand new version of John Lennon's uh, ballad called "Love," which we released in the beginning of May. And and you know, Kathleen was so great to work with because she said, "I don't want this to be about me. I want this to be about shepherds." And the video that we launched on May 6th uh, has a lot of the staff and the clients and the volunteers in it talking about the the important services and programs that we deliver. Um, so Kathleen is just um, such a wonderful person to work with, uh, as well as the 10 other musicians that we, we are working with here. And um, I, I do want the audience to know that on June 17th, we'll have a virtual concert. And at the end of this concert will be a very, very special presentation of a Beatles song that we believe speaks to the hop, the hope and optimism that we have for, for not only our, our, our clients, those experiencing homelessness, but also our community. We want to elevate the spirit of this city. Um, we've, we've all struggled through this pandemic uh, at different levels, and we, we could sure use a good morale booster. For sure. And we want, we want this to be that morale booster that people hopefully tune into on June 17th for a minimal donation of, of $25. And Sam, $25 uh, provides 10 meals in our community kitchen. Um, so we're asking for that contribution, that donation, uh, and then people will be able to enjoy uh, a very special presentation that we put together. It really is amazing, and I know that uh, certainly working uh, in the homeless sector, working at the Shepherds of Good Hope, and of course, you're a dad, right? And I think Mm -hmm. when uh, we have that experience as parents working in that sector, we see that these are, um, you know, these are daughters, these are sons, Mm -hmm. these are aunts Mm -hmm. and uncles and moms and dads, and these are family to someone. And I think that's a really important piece that we sometimes forget. We were driving down King Edward. We're, you know, busy getting to where we want to go. And we might see someone and quickly judge. And the bottom line is, is that is someone's child. Yeah. And, and, you know, Sam, we we at Shepherds, we start all the discussions about homelessness with a very, uh, very simple premise uh, that people experiencing homelessness are people. You know, they, they have their stories, they, they have a narrative, they, they have a background, they have an upbringing. And you know what? They also have a future. Um, so our vision for that future is one in which those who are experiencing homelessness, we want to make it as brief as possible and that we deliver empathy and compassion to, to every service or every program uh, and every uh, contact that we have with those who are experiencing homelessness because it is temporary.
it, it doesn't define the person um, that, that may be going through homelessness for, for reasons which you and I may never quite understand. And that, that is where the community can really come together. And, and we're asking people to come together for, for Sing for Hope. And it's, it's, and by the way, we want to have fun here, right? When of course. We want people, yeah, yeah. We, want, we, we want everyone to enjoy these great musicians, uh, you know, J.W. Jones, who is an international blues star and has played a lead role in this producing. He was my first phone call. Um, and he's played with Buddy Guy, Jimmy Vaughn, Hubert Sumlin, who played with Howlin' Wolf. Eric Eggleston is our, our, our lead producer. Um, he's worked with, with a variety of local musicians. Angelique Francis, who has a beautiful jazz voice. The other thing I just want to mention quickly is we've, we're showcasing our city, Sam. We've filmed the music video in 11 locations across wow. our community. And we're going to bring it all together into this very dynamic presentation. And the 12th the musical group that's in this are the residents at the Oaks, the Shepherds of Good Hope uh, supportive housing unit. Our own residents are going to be in the in the special Beatles presentation because we want to showcase their talents, their experiences, and their personalities. Amazing. Every time I talk to you, I'm so inspired. And uh, obviously, uh, President and CEO Deirdre Fry, I please send her our love as well uh, from uh, from City News as you uh, as you work to really care for the most vulnerable people in our city. Thank you so much for everything you do. Thanks, Sam. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. David Smith, it has been a full show today. We have talked about so much today. And, you know, on my mind certainly right now is, is we know, the action we need to take on so many of these topics, whether it be, you know, connecting with the Shepherds of Good Hope or whether it be uh, learning more about um, the Truth and Reconciliation Report. What are your thoughts after today? Gosh, did we ever cover a lot of ground today? Mm. I will say this. I will say that I hope the people who listen to today's show will take away from it not a negative emotion, not a feeling of of judgment or a feeling like their perspective hasn't been represented necessarily. I just hope that people take what they've heard on the show today and uh, and use it to to further get involved and edify themselves on some of these big picture issues that don't they don't have to be contentious. They don't have to be arguments. They don't have to be fights. It should be a process of learning and acknowledgement for, for all of us. And I will say that the one thing consistent that I've seen through the last 48 hours of news coverage on the issue of the residential schools is time and time again across the board, all the, the advocates and the people who work in this space are asking for predominantly one thing, and it's just go to the website and read the findings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It, there's a lot there. Don't be intimidated by it. Read as much as you'd like to read. Go through the recommendations and, and just think about uh, about perspectives that, that you haven't, uh, haven't necessarily considered for yourself. And, and don't feel bad about having any sort of uh, initial emotional reaction to what you're reading. Just accept uh, accept what you're feeling, accept what you're thinking, and, and try to open your mind and consider some alternate perspectives. Brilliant. Thank you so much, David, for everything you do for this show. Once again, Sam Laprad filling in for Rob Snow. Stay with us. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details.